Precinct, I'll call this uh, meeting to order. Uh, Casey Griffin, will you please call the road to establish a quorum? Mr. Cobbins. Ms. Hartgrove. Here. Mr. Holt. Here. Mr. Smith, Dr. Smith. Victoria Harp will designate for Dr. Smith. Mr. Jensen. Here. Mr. Molenauer. Mr. Morrow. Here. Mr. Wells. Mr. Chairman. Here. Mr. Chairman, you have six voting members present. I declare that a quorum is present and we're duly convened. I further declare that Daryl Cobbins and Jordan Molenauer are excused without objection. Pursuant to Section 8, Policy 1.400 of the Board Meetings Policy, workshops or meetings of the State Board sitting as a Committee of the Whole, I ask unanimous consent that the State Board dissolve itself into a Committee of the Whole for the purposes of conducting our workshop. Is there an objection? No objection. I declare then that we are a Committee of the Whole for the purposes of conducting our workshop. I want to remind all presenters to give their name and position before addressing the Board. So we'll proceed with the agenda. Uh, Dr. Morrison, you want to say some comments first, and then I'll say a few too. I'll just say it's great to be here together. We had a, a really engaged morning in Cheatham County. Heard from parents, students, educators. Um, it was just a really good way to ground, I think, our, our conversations for today and tomorrow, and appreciate all of you who helped make that possible. Um, but no, I'm, I'm looking forward to digging into some of the topics on the agenda this afternoon. Yes, uh, it was a very good morning, and, and I think we did learn a lot. We can always learn when we listen to our uh, teachers and parents and students and, and the leaders, and that was very helpful. I would also like to uh, welcome two new members to our uh, board staff today, uh, Catherine Ann Johnson. This is her first official uh, full meeting of the board. Catherine Ann is our public information officer. There she is, <laughs> looking around. <laughs> Welcome, Catherine Ann. I'm glad to have you. And I've been working with you now for about a month and a half, and I'm very impressed with how responsive you are. Thank you. And then our new, newest uh, is Ryan Shanahan from uh, he's assist, associate legal counsel. Ryan, welcome to the, welcome to the board staff. With that, uh, we'll proceed, and uh, Mr. Nathan James will talk to us about legislative updates. It's been a pretty busy season, right? Yes, sir, it has. I'm Nathan James, and I'm your Deputy Executive Director for Legislative and External Affairs. Please feel free to say that five times fast. So <clears throat> I'm going to give an overview of the legislative session, and all the members have been sent a um, a lovely legislative update which listed all of the bills passed in education this year and uh, certainly want to thank um, Alex Anderson who's one of the attorneys on on our team we this year uh, became subscribers to a, a service that that uh, helped us with with some of that tracking and the process and his uh, his work has also been invaluable in this area so who are we to the legislature well number one we're truth tellers, that is we strive to give accurate information and we're well respected for our integrity. When we make mistakes, we correct them. And sometimes that means starting out a hearing and saying, I told you this last time and this, this was an error. It also means we don't conveniently reinterpret our rules or the law to be what we wish it says. And for that, it helps us, it helps uh, go a long way to be trusted advisors to the legislature. We're not part of the administration, so we work with members on their vision for education and help them to avoid pitfalls and unintended consequences. Uh, we work to understand their individual constituencies and the challenges they face. And a lot of those things are sometimes very unique to their areas. So how do we build that understanding? Well, there's a lot of legislative and district visits. And we try to uh, do that in ways like our days in the district, or 
spending time with those members in their districts uh, for important meetings, things that are important to them. Um, and that, that's, that goes a long way. These, uh, these activities also help us because we, we tend to do them when we're not needy in any way. So over the years, that, uh, that partnership has, has been very good for the board. Obviously, with the creation of the standards review process, which we're in now, in 15 and 16, expansions of the legal and research and the legislative affairs, the creation of the Charter Commission was certainly something that we consulted with the administration and the General Assembly on. A lot of good things have come through the years, and we appreciate all of the, the partnerships. Um, and, and to be fair also, there have been countless ill-advised laws that, that have been avoided. So let's go to 2023 and go by the numbers. There were some 1,860 total bills introduced this legislative session. Of that, the, the numbers vary, but we're there's general consensus on 293 education bills and resolutions with roughly 54 K-12 bills and another nine resolutions that passed. Let's, let's go to our priorities, that is, those of the board that became law this year. Public Chapter 92, this was Senator Pody and Representative Carringer, uh, removed the provisional law that allowed the uh, Charter School Center to certify charter board trainings. Why is that important? Because they're actually doing those trainings at this point in time. And so we wanted to make sure that we were avoiding the appearance of a conflict of interest. Public Chapter 93 by Senator Pody and Representative Carringer, that removed the ineffectual language that required the board to revoke the license of an educator who was delinquent in the repayment of student loans. You remember we, we used to have to take a vote on that at least in December on all, all those revocations that would have to happen. The underlying statutory language on that uh, changed, but the, the section that, that talked about the State Board of Education was still in the law, so no more. This next one was by Senator Pody and Representative Moody. This legislation removed the authority to create rules governing school buses and moved it from the State Board of Education to the Department of Safety. It, it took effect on the 4th of April for rulemaking purposes, but will go into full effect July 1st, 2024. Again, the, the State Board has never had a, a set of experts on this matter, and we were taking action based on what the Department of Safety was bringing. So this, uh, this was a, an appropriate alignment. Public Chapter 192 by Senator Lumberg, Representative Hurt. That legislation changed the standards review cycle for ELA, math, social studies, and science to a minimum of once every eight years instead of once every six years. Um, this bill, for example, caused a net decrease in our lease in our annual appropriation by about ten or fifteen thousand dollars. But it was also the the right thing to do. We met just this in Cheatham County. We, we were thanked by the uh, by the administration there uh, for for the change that took place. Uh, in it, it was uh, expected to to save local districts millions of dollars. So another one, this, this was a busy session for the State Board of Education. Public Chapter 222, that's Senator White, Representative Slater. And uh, Representative Slater is a, a freshman member from um, up in Sumner County. And he's also a dean uh, at Welch College up there. And he, he has uh, very much distinguished himself, I would say, in this, in this first session. Uh, very keen intellect, and he, he was extremely helpful in a number of ways. But on this one, um, that legislation in conjunction with 267 cleaned up language in the statute related to licensure discipline. The bill specifically prevented the re reactivation of licenses of persons who would not be able to obtain an original license due to their criminal offenses, right? So in other words, it was just a loophole that, that was there. Uh, Senator White, you'll notice, carried both of these bills. Uh, the Senate Education Committee used to take up the um, educator licensure discipline bills that we have, and they would all join as co-sponsors. And there's, there is a, um, since the retirement of Senator Gresham, Senator White generally carries those bills. And um, so naturally, we brought those to her first. 
That legislation in conjunction with Public Chapter 222, among other things, created a statutory allowance for a court-ordered license to be uh, license surrendering to be done without a contested case hearing. So up to this point in time, you would have a judge who would order someone to surrender their license, but because of another statutory provision, we still had to go through the process of having a contested case hearing, as if uh, an administrative law judge could overrule what the actual, you know, uh, circuit court or, or uh, a chancellor's order was. And so it, it just was, was inappropriate. We got that, got that fixed. There was also one more Eric Commission bill. That's public chapter 269 by Senator White and Representative Slater. The Education Recovery and Innovation Commission was attached to the State Board of Education when it existed for 18 months. Some of the provisions that were large on its uh, radar were removing the you know, fiscal disincentive to early graduation, trying to marry uh, the, the CTE programs at the K-12 level with those at the TCAT level. And uh, another one was this bill. And th this legislation authorizes an LEA to award high school student credit for a course offered by the LEA's high school if the student attains a qualifying score on a course credit exam without requiring the student to enroll in the course. Uh, that act took effect on the 28th of April. I also want to, uh, to mention that uh, we've, we've got some of our legislative partners here uh, who, who are in attendance today. We certainly work uh, as an independent voice, but with um, advocacy groups uh, from uh, across the state and with, with, varied, uh, uh, w with varied interests in order to, to try to craft the best legislation possible. And that last bill was an example of, of one of those with uh, input from uh, SCORE and Excel and Ed and uh, various, various other uh, organizations. So this next one is uh, going to be of particular interest to Mr. Wells um, as a National Guard veteran and a, and a combat veteran. The Military Interstate Children's Compact is attached to the State Board of Education. You've heard me talk a lot about it. It makes certain that uh, students, when they're relocated because of their parents' military assignments, uh, that their graduation isn't put off because they show up with three months towards graduation and they've got all of their, uh, all of their requirements fulfilled from the previous school. Um, so that's, that's of some great importance. What the council did which is, again, attached to the state board. The council asked us to bring legislation this year that would expand that coverage to reservists and Tennessee National Guardsmen. Now, why is that such a big deal, you say? Well, you know, we're not, it's not like it's the mid-2000s. You don't see the, necessarily the combat deployments of those folks as frequently. But the difference, one of the main differences between your guardsmen and your reservists is that the only way sometimes to make, to make rank, to get to the next promotion, is to be willing to change your uh, training station. And in the case especially of the air guard, sometimes that means someone is, uh, if they want to go from captain to major or tech sergeant to master sergeant, they may have to change from McGee-Tyson air guard base to Memphis. So one of the things that has kept people from moving forward in their careers was concern about moving their families. This bill extends the same protections of the MIC-3 compact to reservists and National Guardsmen uh, and, and women when they make those transfers. It's by Senator Powers and Representative Reagan. So revisions to the third grade retention law for next year. This is Senate Bill uh, 300 by Senator Lumberg. And this was something uh, Mr. Morrow listened to just the other day. We, we discussed it with the, uh, with the subcommittee there. Uh, I will go through what the present law says, and I'll go through what some of the changes are. But uh, remember that this has, uh, this has just been signed by the governor on the 5th of May. So there's, there's a lot yet to be put, uh, put together on that. So our present law says that uh, a student in the third grade must not be promoted to the next grade level 
unless the student is determined to be proficient in English language arts based on the students achieving a performance level rating of on track or mastered at the, on the ELA portion of the student's most recent Tennessee Comprehensive Assessment Program. That's the TCAP. Unless the student is an English language learner and has received less than two years of ELA instruction, the student was previously retained in any of the grades K-3, or the student is assigned a tutor through the uh, Tennessee All Corps uh, to provide the student with tutoring services for the entirety of the upcoming school year based on those requirements established by the Department of Education. A student who is not proficient in ELA is determined by the students achieving a performance level of rating of below on the ELA portion of the student's most recent TCAP test may be promoted if the student is a learner uh, falls into some of those previous categories that we mentioned. So it also, let's see, the student is, is um, I can go through every piece of the current law as it is, but I, I think you're relatively familiar with it. So I'm going to pass here to what changes under Senate Bill 300. So beginning in the 23-24 20, uh, school year, a student scoring uh, in the approaching category on the ELA portion of the student's most recent TCAP test may be promoted if the student scores within the 50th percentile on the most recently administered state-provided benchmark assessment. In order to use uh, that as an option for promotion, benchmark assessment must be given to the student in a testing environment, and the LEA must agree to provide tutoring services to the student during the fourth grade year. Also, um, want to point out that that's that's the uh, uh, that's the test that the uh, state Department of Education provides uh, for each of the school systems. If this option is utilized for promotion, the LEA must notify the parent in writing of the benefits of enrolling the student in the learning loss bridge camp. There's an appeals process here. Beginning this next school year, the the school district. Now, this is different. A principal, guidance counselor, teacher, other administrator will have the option to file an appeal on behalf of the student if the parent guardian consents in writing. The appeals process, whether initiated by the parent guardian or the school district, only applies to a student who is identified for retention in the third grade based on the student scoring in the approaching category on the ELA portion of the student's most recent TCAP. We are required, the State Board of Education is required to create rules around the process of the school district receiving parental consent for purposes of filing an appeal on behalf of the student's parent or guardian. Beginning of the 23-24 school year, tutoring services are required to be provided for the entirety of the upcoming school year for students who are retained in K-3. That's what I think you were asking about, Mr. Holt. This uh, early intervention is to ensure that all students are receiving the supports needed to succeed in reading at grade level. The Department of Education may procure up to three online tutoring providers for LEAs to use to provide online tutoring services to students. Let's take a look at some other related legislation, and this is not exhaustive because you do not have all afternoon. but. Um, I'm going to go through some, some of the interesting bills. Senate Bill 102 by Senator Garden Hire, Representative Zachary, prohibits an LEA, public charter school, public institution of higher education, the State Board of Education, the Department of Education from requiring an educator, employee of an LEA or charter school, faculty member, employee um, uh, of a public institution of higher education to complete or participate in implicit bias training. And it defines implicit bias training and prohibits adverse licensure and employment actions from being taken against any individual uh, for the individual's failure or refusal to participate in implicit bias training. Public Chapter 144, this is by Senator Johnson and Representative Lamberth, requires LEAs to conduct summer learning camps and after-school learning mini camps annually instead of only in the summers immediately following the 2021 and 2122 school years. This is an administration bill and um, revises the definition of a priority student to allow additional at-risk children and students entering certain grade levels to participate in this after-school learning mini-camp or the learning loss bridge camp. So, and that, that's good. It puts, puts things in um, uh, on a perpetual basis there. Public Chapter 114, uh, that is uh, the act that your your staff uh, worked extensively 
with the Department of Labor and Workforce Development on. And it uh, changes references in the code uh, to the GED and the high set to high school equivalency credential. Senate Bill 281 uh, increases the starting educator salaries to 50000 annually, not immediately, but over the next several years, and prohibits dues deductions for educators' professional associations. So that... Um, I went through on on Friday and and hit it to be most uh, the most updated it could be. So I apologize if some of these things have been assigned public chapters in the last couple of days. Senate Bill 466 by Senator Rose and Representative Cochran establishes that teachers and other employees of public schools and local education agencies are not required to use a student's preferred pronoun when referring to the student if the preferred pronoun is not consistent with the student's biological sex and are further shielded from civil liability and adverse employment action when doing so. Establishes that a public school or LEA is not civilly liable if a teacher or employee of the public school or LEA refers to the student using a pronoun that is consistent with the biological sex of the student to whom the teacher or employee is referring, even if the pronoun is not the student's preferred pronoun. Public Chapter 872, this is by Senator Ackberry and Representative Clemens changes a suggested set of requirements for African-American history standards to be included in the social studies standards to a requirement that it be included. All of these things, I think, except for one or two um, items in, in the list in that bill are already in our social studies standards. And um, of course, our standards recommendation committee uh, has, has had it made rather clear to them that we need to adhere to each and every one of these requirements that's placed in law. Public Chapter 278 by Senator Hensley and Representative Lynn makes it a Class E felony for a book publisher, distributor, or seller to knowingly sell or distribute obscene matter to a public school serving any of grades K-12, in addition to the punishment authorized for a Class E felony, which is one to six years imprisonment and a fine of up to $3,000, a person who violates uh, this amendment's prohibition will additionally be fined at least $10,000, but not more than $100,000. Public Chapter 316 by Senator Roberts and Representative Darby. This act allows members of boards and commissions to continue to serve until their replacements are appointed and further revises requirements that Standards Recommendation Committee members uh, be legislatively confirmed. So from this point forward, only those appointed by the governor will be subject to legislative confirmation, and the six members appointed by the speakers will not be. This act unfortunately came into effect uh, after the final date of, of uh, our, our member from the 1st Congressional District's uh, service. So. Senate Bill 1443 by Senator Roberts and Representative Fritz. This bill requires parents to give written consent that students participate in instruction included in the family life curriculum. So in other words, rather than it being an opt-out, it would now be an opt-in. Senate Bill 1458 by Senator White and Mr. Speaker Sexton awards six weeks paid maternity leave uh, for public school teachers and administrators, et cetera, following the birth or stillbirth of a child. That's uh, another one we, we discussed this morning with some teachers. Public Chapter 284 by Senator Stevens and Representative White. Inspired by Representative White's own experience as an educator, this act allows a school district to hire as a full-time teacher a teacher candidate who has received a temporary permit. To be eligible to receive a temporary permit, the teacher candidate must be enrolled in an educator preparation program and have completed all coursework except for the clinical practice portion and submit with the permit application a letter of recommendation uh, from both the EPP and the director of schools. The conditional offer must state that the director of schools has notified the commissioner of education of the inability to fill that vacancy and the intent to employ the teacher candidate. The time the teacher candidate is employed as a full-time teacher satisfies his or her teaching requirement. So again, this is another one of those. You, sometimes you'll see in legislation that passes, you'll see a different enactment date for the rules so that things can be done in time uh, for the effective date. Doesn't always happen. Uh, obviously, when we adopt a set of rules and then a piece of legislation is passed which disagrees with those rules, the legislation always takes priority. 
Public Chapter 311. That act allows honorably discharged military veterans to use their military service experience and training to receive an occupational teaching permit. Before the veteran can receive the teaching permit, the director of schools is required to certify to the local board and the commissioner that school district is unable to secure a qualified educational, uh, or I'm sorry, occupational educator with a valid license. So both of these were priorities of the school boards association. And uh, uh, these were pieces of legislation that we worked with with those folks on. Let me also mention to you that on public chapter 311, you see an example of an enactment date with a specific time on it. So it says this takes effect at 12.01 a.m., which means that the legislature has also passed another piece of law affecting the exact same text, which would take effect at 12. This would take effect at 12.01. This way, this bill doesn't cancel out the other bill. And it, it means that the, um, the legislative attorneys have, have put it together so that the two pieces of legislation can flow together. Otherwise, what you'd have is a bill that passes today would be overrun by a bill that passes tomorrow. So again, we've got a complete list of all education legislation which has been emailed to members. But um, with that, I would say, I would say we've, we've had a successful session. I'm certainly happy to take questions. I know there's a lot of bills and uh, we'll certainly try to answer or I can chat with you after, whatever members would prefer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. James. Questions and comments from Mr. James? Thank you, sir. The only thing I would Chair, say, Mr. Chairman, Chairman, oh, I'm sorry. Chairman Hartgrove. Thank you. I just wanted to recognize James and Mr. James, and thank you for pulling that all together, because I know that's a lot of information, and you're on the Hill keeping track of all of this for us, and I definitely, and I know other members do too, I'm only speaking for myself, appreciate the detail that you provided today, because I think it does help us, those of us who are not able to watch it actively on a regular basis, appreciate this uh, recap for us. Thank you so much. Madam Chairman Emeritus, I, I must say that it was nice this year to have a wingman. Uh, Chairman Eby came up on, uh, what, two or three occasions, and uh, it, it was nice to be in two places at once. Um, and I, I'll make that invitation, as I have before, any member that wants to uh, come up and, uh, and enjoy uh, some long days of uh, protein shakes and uh, quickly gotten snacks and uh, wants to spend some days up there and Warren or Mr. Wells, if you'd like to uh, re-experience some former traumatic days, you'd be more than welcome to, to come up any day you like. Mr. Wells. I I'm never coming back. So. <laughs> <laughs> I will say this is uh, it was very enlightening and eye opening to me to uh, sit there and watch the process. But I'll also say that uh, Mr. James and Ms. Sanders and Dr. Morrison, the, they had the respect of the legislature and to watch them up there testifying on our behalf, uh, we should know that we are well represented uh, during these uh, legislative sessions and we appreciate it very much. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Jensen. I may ask. Mr. James, are there sure pieces of legislation that did not make it out that would come back up next year that are of significance that you could talk to us about? Uh, if not, then for whatever reason, I'm just curious if there are things that didn't make it that are most likely to be brought back up and any support that we might bring to those uh, under your leadership would be helpful. Well, th that's... Uh, that's kind of a precarious question to answer. It's, it's, um, there, there will be pieces of legislation that didn't make it, and, and you know certainly that that members have uh, varying degrees of interest in. Um, I'd be happy to chat with you one on one afterwards to to see where uh, you might like to uh, um, avail yourself of conversations. If, I, I would like to do that, but if you would keep us advised on those uh, moving forward, that would be helpful to me. Yes, sir. I'm I'm happy to do so. And of course, it you know with our our position with the State Board of Education is we you know even the bills that we bring are 
pretty well right in our lane. There, there are things that directly affect the board. You, you know, we're um, and and I want to say thank you to the board for for always um, you know giving me the the freedom to be to be frank and clear with with legislators to give them a be, the best advice I know how. Um, I appreciate that. Uh, it, it's it's also good to be able to to partner with a lot of very hardworking folks on on some of these things to to see what what's in the best interest of children and and what we can do about it. But um, with the legislature, you have to remember you've got 132 uh, members who all have different ideas about what exactly is the right way to go. I, you know, I can tell you. you you have been a tireless champion on all things CTE. To, to you, you're, you're, you're never satisfied unless you see that um, connection between what is the student getting and how are they going to be able to make a living? How is that going to plug in uh, to the workforce? And I would say, you know, our ability and yours, frankly, to be, to be a, a gentle voice has uh, been very helpful. Uh, very helpful, I, I would say, especially you, you look at, at TISA and its ability to, to address things. You, you look at uh, any number of pieces of legislation that, that forge partnerships where they, they haven't existed before. And I, I would say, you know, it, it's nice to be able to be a part of that where it's appropriate. So. Any other questions or comments for Mr. James? Thank you, Mr. James. Thank you, sir. Next on the agenda is a third grade promotion and retention adequate growth uh, by Dr. Eve Carney, Dr. David Laird, and I'm going to ask Mr. Sam Piercy to come up here and sit at the head table since he's soon to be the interim, and uh, uh, we welcome him here to be up here at the table as this presentation goes forward. And if you have anything to present, then you can still speak from here. But at the same time, I, I also want to make a comment that uh, uh, as we went work through these items, uh, third grade retention, uh, vacancy data, early literacy, I, the cooperation that we have received from the Department of Ener uh, Energy, <laughs> my old job, <laughs> the Department of Education uh, has really been exceptional. Uh, we, I want to thank thank each one of you. I know Robin has worked very very hard and. Uh, the staff has worked hard to provide answers. Not that we always agree, and we will have questions, but uh, uh, we do appreciate uh, uh, providing the information uh, in a timely manner. That would be wonderful. Okay. <laughs> Are you speaking virtually? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
we want to keep our focus on. Um, this is about students who have scored um, not proficient on their TCAPs and, and being centered on what we can do to support them moving forward. That is the work that we do at the department every day. It is the work of this board and it is the work that you witnessed in the field today and across the state. Everyone is always focused on student success. So I just want to make sure that I say that at the, the onset here. Let's see. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Go to the next. There we go. Um, so we'll we'll do a quick overview here um, that kind of lays out adequate growth and making sure that we have normed on our approach to it. I'll spend a couple of minutes on an explanation of the baseline assessment and the post test, and then very bluntly highlight the calculation of adequate growth. So really making sure that we see the math for it and all feel comfortable with the way that works and then close out with an operational timeline. I think there have been a number of questions around when does all this happen? It is in very short order and very quick. It is a fast summer. And so I wanna make sure that we take a moment and highlight all of those. You can go ahead and jump to the next one too. Um, so as a reminder, adequate growth is laid out in 4963115 um, and applies to students who score approaching on their TCAP assessment. And the way it is, Situated in law is it is part of a two-prong approach. So a student must maintain 90% attendance at the camp and the student must demonstrate adequate growth as determined by the department. Um, we've laid out on the screen here, uh, the purpose of adequate growth is to give students an opportunity to demonstrate that their performance can be responsive to interventions and additional supports. Um, I'm going to abbreviate this last part and say, and that that continues, okay? So I, I wanna be sure that I note that. Just to be clear, the, the goal of adequate growth is not to say that a student has reached proficiency. It is to identify that they are being responsive to the supports that are being provided to them. And if those supports were to continue and be strong in that upcoming year, that we have confidence in the student's success. The department set two goals for adequate growth and how we are laying out this calculation. The first one is clarity. The second one is alignment. So in the first bullet there, you see set clear expectations for performance and how teachers, families, all stakeholders can support a student in demonstrating it. We discussed a lot in March that this is a very short timeline. Any way you cut the deck, it is a short timeline. And so stakeholders need that clarity on what a student needs to achieve to meet the goals of promotion. The second piece is alignment. I know there have been lots of questions about all the different kinds of assessments that are out there in the world. Um, but we wanted to ensure that there was alignment to standards-based assessment. That is what triggers a student's potential for uh, being at risk for retention. It should also be the measure that is used to determine moving out of that risk of, of retention. Right. And then the last part here, again, we'll kind of delve into it more, but sets that 5% threshold. You're all good. That's <laughs> Thanks. Um, so at the top line, we're measuring from a baseline to a post test, and we are looking for a five percentage point improvement. And again, I want to draw attention to some of those emphasis points from the last meeting. Five percentage points, not a 5% increase for, for those math fun folks in the crowd. All right, that's me too. I, I, mean, I mean, I'm all in. <laughs> all right, jumping on in, go ahead for the next slide. Thank you. Um, adequate growth on the baseline. A couple of things that I would like to lead with before we delve into the details on this. There was a lot of conversation in March around how we are justifying the use of TCAP as the baseline. And so I just want to draw very explicit attention to the fact that in law, um, the, the statute around adequate growth very clearly defines that the post-test will be the post-test offered at the end of summer camps. That is the reference that is made but that statute is silent on what will be the baseline for this determination. So one of the commitments we made back in March was to make sure that we differentiate language appropriately to separate the concept of the pretest at the summer camps from what would be used in the baseline determination of adequate growth. The other piece that I will just be sure to note here is that that still left a conflict with this proposed policy and existing state board rule, specifically the universal reading screener rule, 
and the definition of what pretest is in that. So you also have as part of your considerations for tomorrow, a red line to that rule that simply removes the last sentence that defines what pretest is. That rule currently states that the pretest will be used for the purpose of adequate growth determination. We're simply removing that and using, using these definitions here for the baseline. So we have two possible paths for the baseline assessment. The first is the third grade ELA TCAP. So that is the spring administration, which we have now closed and we will be releasing uh, results on first round tomorrow. So stay tuned. Um, and just to be clear, that excludes the writing portion of the ELA TCAP. And we can discuss a little bit more about that in a moment. The second pass at the baseline is the third grade ELA TCAP retake opportunity, which will open up here in a week or so, a little bit more. Um, so we are looking for the higher performance on either of these two assessments. Um, just to kind of highlight from a, what these baseline assessments are intending to do, three, three points up there. The first is coverage. We wanna ensure that the baseline assessment has a good representation of the TCAP blueprint as it relates to reading items. Um, and so both of these proposed baseline assessments achieve that goal. The second is alignment, as sort of mentioned before, ensuring that we are continuing to measure progress against standards and as opposed to skills or other, other types of assessments. And then the third piece up here is, is noting time. Um, by leveraging the TCAP and the retake opportunity, we are ensuring that educators have the most amount of time possible to invest and intervene in student supports to generate adequate growth. Right? If we only used, as a counterexample, the pretest of summer camps, you are limiting to that window. While that may measure the impact of summer camps, we do not believe it fully captures what adequate growth could look like from the TCAP opportunity moving forward. On the post-test administration, this is the summer camp post-test for third grade. So just to be clear, that part is articulated in law, mirrored in rule, and mirrored here in policy. Um, to give a little sense of what that is, it is still standards-based. Um, so in the same way that we have talked about the importance of ensuring that alignment on the baseline piece, that remains important for the post-test as well. From a design perspective, it mirrors the TCAP and the TCAP retake opportunity by having passage sets and corresponding questions. From a coverage of standards perspective, it also mirrors the TCAP blueprint for reading. And then it is going to be administered through the same secure testing application that educators are familiar with already in the state. Um, so we have tried to ensure that we are not adding in additional testing requirements while making sure that this post-test is robust enough to actually measure what we hope it can measure. I will just note before we kind of move past the baseline and post-test that these all do exclude the writing portion. So there are no constructed responses. That is a matter of practicality and being able to turn around results for stakeholders. When you have constructed responses, they take longer to score. Decisions need to be made on certain timelines. Therefore, those are not included in the establishment of the baseline or in the post-test. Shifting down to the calculation. Um, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. So again, I wanted to be crystal clear and make sure that we laid out what this exactly looks like. So on the baseline score, whether that is the ELA TCAP in the spring administration or the retake opportunity, we are looking at points earned divided by points possible and getting a percent score. On the post-test at the end of camp, we're doing the same thing, points earned over points possible and getting a score. If you look at the gap between those two, that Z value there, if it is equal to or higher than a five percentage point increase, adequate growth has been met. And just to put numbers in there, again, wanna make sure that this is all laid out. You can see an example of the possible points. Um, there have been lots of questions over time about how many points are possible, and I just wanna note that will fluctuate year to year based on the, the design and construct of both the TCAP the retake and the post-test. So these are just examples for that use to give you a sense of numbers being applied. Um, I, will, I will be brief here, but did want to make sure that we sort of noted a little bit of the back-end conversations and discussions of where the five percentage point threshold came from. 
Um, there was a lot of talk about what amount of the instructional calendar, 180 instructional days, the summer camps might represent, right? And most of our summer camps at this age are operating for about 16 instructional days. That is about 8.8% of the school year. Um, but it is also important to note that summer camp is not the same operation of depth that in traditional school year is either. You may have a different teacher that you are working with during that time who's working to establish rapport, may not know the, the same kind of unique learning styles that each student has. Um, and so we wanted to just acknowledge that and, and signal that we looked both at sort of the length of the camps, but also some reality checks about what is, is feasible during that amount of time. A couple of core assumptions, and, and I realize a lot of people lead with the core assumptions, but I think it's important to kind of follow up on what all this means when you have said a student is meeting adequate growth. Remember, we're still talking about students who have previously achieved an approaching score. So when we talk about being responsive to intervention, this isn't about a student who may have scored below. There are a lot more supports that student may need to reach proficiency. Approaching, that is still a wide band, and I, I believe we'll probably talk about that some. Um, but, but this is still about being able to find what is possible during that time and making sure that we are coupling that with additional supports. So that second part on there is important as well. Um, I recognize that across the board, there are promotion pathways that would um, make it so that a student is not required to have a tutor in the fourth grade or things like that. What I will note just from a department perspective and from an operations perspective, um, Nathan mentioned it earlier, TISA still includes funding for those students in the upcoming school year. There are still dollars associated. There are still summer camp funds being generated. Um, it is our hope and, and belief that districts will continue to provide these students with every support available to them. We don't want to kind of push the notion that just because you have met one of these things that you do not need anything more. Last but not least, just to give a quick overview of the operational timeline, May 19th, tomorrow, we will release raw scores. On May 26th, no later than May 26th, I will say as David smiles at me there, um, we'll have the TCAP conversion table. So that would formally lock in a student as either below or approaching so that they understand exactly what pathways are open to them. Um, we have our retake window opening on May 22nd. Um, is that Monday? Monday. Yeah, running through June 5th, so that, that is available and we'll return results on that within 48 hours. Camps, varying dates by district. So I will just note here that the timeline pivots from very specific dates to individual summer calendars for districts. Um, so end of camp dates will vary, but they will administer the post-test after camps have completed um, or makeup days as appropriate. We will return any calculations of adequate growth within five business days of the post-test data having been submitted to the department, and we will do that on a rolling basis. And then, as you all know, if a student has participated in summer interventions, the districts must notify parents of any final retention determinations 10 days prior to the start of the school year. Um, I think the one other date that wasn't in there, just to note, is that the post-test opens on June 13th. So that will be open and available for districts as they wrap up their camps starting in just a couple weeks as well. And with that, happy to take any questions or kick them to David as appropriate. Thank you, Mr. Pierce. Thank you, Mr. Pierce. Questions for him? Mr. Yes. Chairman. Mr. Runt. Mr. Oh. Pierce, thank, thank you for the, the presentation. Um, and I, I had a few questions. Uh, my first is, so as I understand it from the operational timeline we were just looking at, students will learn tomorrow if they are proficient or not. There'll be another week until they learn if they were not proficient, if they are either below or approaching, which I think means for that week they will have to plan on summer camp. Because if they're approaching, they wouldn't have to do summer camp, but they won't know whether they're below or approaching. So a lot of that week period where I guess everybody has to, if you're in that category, you're going to summer camp, you learn a week later, maybe you don't have to. Is that correct? 
that that's correct. I will say that from a timing perspective, and I'm looking for David for confirmation one more time here, um, but we are on track to actually have those cut scores back earlier for third grade, such that we hope to actually be able to release that tomorrow as well, which would up that timeline for them. Great. Yeah, I mean, obviously everyone knows this, but just for planning purposes for families, knowing whether they have to attend summer camp or not, um, time is of the essence. You all know that. So I'm glad, glad to hear that. Okay. Um, also, what, what were to happen, and, and maybe the answer is this is not going to happen, but if there were some technical issues or otherwise such that scores uh, were not reported tomorrow or cut scores were not reported on this timeline, is that just, it's not going to happen or is there some contingency planning for that? Hi, David Laird, Assistant Commissioner for Assessment and Accountability. Um, we'll be ready tomorrow. We've seen the results. We've had a chance to process them to run our own internal quality control checks on them. Um, and so we're, we're in, we'll be in good shape. Uh, and we will have, just to be very clear, uh, in our initial communication on this, because the timeline was so aggressive, um, we were not uh, explicit about whether or not we would have the additional cut scoring information between below and approaching because there are some elements of the scoring process that it's just hard to know how long they might take. Um, but the process has gone incredibly smoothly. The districts did a fantastic job of testing third grade ELA early in the cycle, shipping us those results immediately. And so we'll have that additional cut score information tomorrow as well. Great, thank you. Um, the, my understanding is TCAP ELA is used as the benchmark for determining adequate growth. The pretest by as defined in law is not. Is there still a pretest that's going to be administered um, at the beginning of summer camp? And, and what role will that play then if, if the sort of diagnostic testing for adequate growth is always already happening through the uh, TCAP? So pretests are available um, for districts. Um, given their use and interpretation, the best possible role for them to play is for something to be more formative. Uh, because of the stakes associated, obviously, with TCAP tests, with retakes, with the post-test assessments, those all are designed to be secure assessments. Uh, we're essentially, because of the quality associated with the evidence they need to provide, we're using our operational TCAP item bank to build all of those assessments. So we went in a very different direction with the post-tests in, in these TCAP grade levels. Um, so we're using TCAP-like assessments. So they assess all the same standards. They're built on roughly the same blueprints. But we have a portfolio of non-secure versions of those tests that have historically always been available to districts. You call these our interim assessments or our checkpoint assessments. And these have been available for districts to use previously in a non-secure way throughout the school year for them to get sort of a predictive window about how students might perform on the TCAP test. Uh, so they make really, really good assessments to use for this pretest purpose because teachers can administer them and immediately look at the items that were administered and the student responses to those items and get formative feedback at the moment in which they were assessed. So the purpose of these assessments is to actually help the people that are doing the teaching this summer and give them sort of standards-based information about the strengths and weaknesses of their kids. And we just happen to have a, a ready batch of assessments for that purpose. Great. Um, and my, my last question, I, I think this is clear, but just wanted to, to confirm that if a, a student who is approaching takes the summer, is enrolled in summer camp, um, does not receive adequate, earn adequate growth, then they can, they can be promoted through the uh, tutoring pathway through fourth grade. So they start off trying to, to do the summer camp, don't receive adequate growth, they are promoted so long as they are doing the tutoring. Is that, that's correct. Other Chair. questions? Oh. Mr. Chair? Mr. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I, uh, <clears throat> um, just, uh, I thought it was clear and I might not be now. Um, so I know this is for students scoring on the approaching and the ELA, but uh, does that include everybody who scores below? Or so anybody who scores below, they're not a part of the retention process? Like, where do they fit in this equation, I guess is what I'm asking, because it would be weird to think that the approaching ones get held back and the below ones keep going. That, that's a fair question. So um, for the purpose of adequate growth, a student must have reached approaching. 
Now, the way this is defined is that if you score that on your spring TCAP administration or you reach that approaching band on the retake opportunity. So say you scored below on the original spring three, third grade ELA TCAP, came back, did the retake opportunity and reached the approaching band, you would open up the pathways within approaching. But if I'm below and I stay below, then I can just keep rolling to fourth grade? You cannot. You okay. must attend the camp 90% of the time and be assigned okay. a tutor the upcoming right. year. That's, yep. <laughs> that's, I thought then it, it got, the wording got confused. Okay, great. So both below and approaching are going to go get remediation uh, and intervention. There's just a different pathway by which they're going to do it. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Mr. Jensen, just before I, yes. I, I want to ask uh, Mr. Pierce, would you please explain the difference between the retake and the pretest? Because we hear these multiple tests, and sometimes I think they get interchanged. Could you repeat the question just a little bit? I want to make sure I understand. Well, there is the TCAP test. Yes. And then following up, they can do a retake on it, but that's not the same as the pretest, is yes. it, or is it? No, the retake is not the same as yeah. the pretests. That's yeah. I, yep. The, the pretests are in so the pretests are in fact tied to the administration of the camps themselves, right. whereas the retake exists separate and apart from the administration of the camps. I thought it was important just to clarify that difference because pretest, pretest, retake, in some ways. Might be. Now, Mr. Jensen, I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, Thank you for your work on this. Appreciate it. How does the superintendent of a school si system figure out what kind of staffing they need for the summer? It just seems like we're here at, you know, middle to the end of May and they got to be ready to go. They don't know how many kids they got, so on and so forth. Is that a fair question? Of course, absolutely fair question. And, you know, I think this is going to be a summer of, of growing pains in that regards, right? This is the third summer that we have had summer camps, but the first time that this law will be in effect. Um, I think the beneficial things that have been in place over time is, is the law that um, Mr. James referenced earlier actually identifies how students can be um, called out for priority status for the summer camps. And that has included their performance on their universal reading screeners throughout the year. So part of, say, what happened after the winter administration of the universal reading screener is we flagged back to districts, data they have, but all the students who were below the 40th percentile on that universal reading screener, they're identified as at risk for a reading deficiency. Those are the students that have been prioritized to the state for camp enrollment purposes. So they have some indicator throughout the year about how that is going and how they might need to staff up for it, but it's a fair recognition that TCAP results come at this time and, and people will have to be responsive in that. So I guess their responsibility at this point would be to ask, uh, an educated guess as to what they are gonna need. Is that a fair statement? I, I think largely so. The one, the one other thing that I think is important to call out is that while all grades are required in law for the summer camps, um, there is no requirement for how districts prioritize students across those grades, giving districts the flexibility to move their capacity as they are planning for where they might have higher summer camp participation. Thank you. Another question? Yes, Mr. Morrow. Uh, I, I know uh, parents don't like surprises, administrators don't like surprises, nobody likes surprises. Uh, so, Theoretically, our district should be, it should be a surprise to anybody. There should, I, in kind of regards to Larry's question, like the data, the assessment, all this is set up that there's not gonna be this giant surprise for their per school of how many kids this qualifies to if they've been benchmarking along the way. Is that correct? I think that's a fair assumption. Okay. And my other question was just with the different types of TCAPs, it kind of goes what uh, Mr. Holt was saying. So in, you have the, the TCAP for the baseline, the pretest, so that's where our sort of, you know, the, the, the initial diagnostic is the TCAP. And then there is the pretest, correct? The progression would be 
child takes a TCAP assessment. Any child that scores below approaching or does not receive a valid score right. for whatever reason, those kids would be strongly encouraged to take the retake assessment. Okay, so the retake would be the, the next retake would, was would try against. Out. But the retake is not the TCAP. It is a version that's similar to the TCAP. The retake is intended, by law, the retake has to determine proficiency. So the department's mandate here is to create an assessment that is as close to the TCAP that we can produce that also fits the timeline for the decisions that are being played out. So it is as close to the TCAP as we can possibly make it. So that was my question was, how are we going to sort of do like standards alignment validity in the outcome of this retake versus what we see in the TCAP to be able to say it's kind of apples to apples comparison. You don't want to have a outcome on a TCAP and then all of a sudden this retake, yep. and if there's not equitable yep. standards alignments that, you know, what they've been testing on throughout True. the year, it's going to give us skewed results. So, so what's our process for sort of validity there? No, happy to. The, the retake was designed very, very similarly to a TCAP test. Okay. Right, we're using our operational item bank. Every item that went on that, we have prior operational or field test statistics for. So the exact same process that goes into building a TCAP test form, we use the exact same processes for building the form for the retake assessment. As previously mentioned, the only significant design difference here is we've removed the writing portions okay. of the assessment, which I don't want to make light of. I mean, from a content perspective, that's a very consequential decision. The department isn't making that lightly, um, but just given the incredibly aggressive timeline and needing to inform parents as quickly as possible, there is a huge time savings for removing that portion of the test. Um, however, we've done a number of analyses that compare the performance of the retake assessment, which is a TCAP without the writing portion, to the performance of the TCAP test overall. Um, we've shared some of the results and some of our analyses with our technical advisory committee um, in consultation with TAC. We feel very confident in saying that the performance levels that we're going to provide on the retake um, have very strong psychometric similarity to what we get out of the spring TCAP. That's great. And then my, I guess, follow-up would be, since it is going to be a, a growing pains type of summer in these things, are we going, A, what's the feedback loop from districts and LEAs back to the department on sort of the practical workings of this so we can, you know, make a more efficient system next year? So, if, you know, how just is, is there a setup for where the, the districts and LEAs are going to be sharing feedback back for a way to improve this? So I'll certainly say on the assessment side of things, there's a number of feedback loops that are built into our processes. We have an advisory committee of practicing educators, our ALAC group that is always informing us and we're checking in with them throughout the administrations. We do a series of regional assessment meetings twice a year where we go out to every core region, okay. um, share information, pick up feedback at that time. Um, you know, we could always be doing better, but I feel that particularly on the administrative side of the house, we have done a lot of really good work to try to uh, to improve those processes over the last few years. And I think we've done really good work sort of responding to, uh, to concerns from the field and the administration space. Okay. And my last, I promise, last question. Uh, what, what is in place if, you know, say, you know, I don't know, 5% of students have to do the retake and then of those 5% that have to do the retake, uh, only or four percent of that group, or, or no, ninety percent of that group, did great on the retake, and they all. I mean, like, how are we checking that the retake, and like year over year, like, should there be a? Uh, I don't know. How, how are you just checking to see if the retake is actually working with the TCAP? Um, you know, there will be a lot of sort of broad and very fine grained ways for us to do that. I mean, because we have item history for every item that's on the retake, you know, we can look and say, are any of these items performing out of historical expectations for any reason for any group of students? So it's not just overall. We'll look very closely at every group of student in Tennessee to wow. make sure that these items are performing, you know, consistent with our expectations. And as long as the items are meeting their parameters, then we'll ultimately feel good about the performance levels that are produced. So you guys are going to keep track of this many people or this is what the average score on the retake was compared to the score on the original TCAP. Yes. So awesome. we use the same scoring parameters for the retake that we would for the TCAP test. Thank you.
So bear with me a minute. <laughs> Comments uh, that you made, Mr. Morrow, that the TCAP and the retake are pretty should be statistically the same. So if a student takes retakes you wouldn't expect a large fraction of those to move from one category to the next. Hopefully, the belows could move into the approaching, puts them into that next promotability. First, do the, does a student get the score that they have, and do they know, need to know what score they have to have to move up the actual score? So typically, a student would not receive any results from spring TCAPs, usually until the fall. Right? So those results are generally not immediately available to folks. Um, and generally, there isn't a lot of visibility about, um, you know, oh, I'll say this, there are graphics, visuals within the individual student score report that do show students how close they were, relatively speaking, to um, different performance levels. So the statistical probability that a student then would move from one category to the next because of the retake is probably pretty low. I would say so, and in part that goes into the rigor and the work that we do to design rigorous TCAP assessments. Those tests have high reliability, and if you keep administering the same tests to a child, their score should not change considerably, particularly if you're administering it just a couple of weeks apart. So I understand, again, why the below would take the retake, hopefully. What is the incentive for the one that is approaching to take the retake? Because if their probability for them to move up uh, into the proficient is very, very low, uh, and if they, in fact they do increase their score, say from 40% to 43%, then the baseline, the way this thing is written, if I understand it correctly, the baseline to determine adequate growth for them of whether they can move forward or not would be now the higher of the two, 40 or 43, would be 43, and now they have to go to 48 to reach adequate growth. Whereas if they started at 40, they didn't take the retake, all they had to do is get to 45 to get adequate growth. So I would say the, the motivation for those students is they truly are approaching is this is a chance for them to demonstrate proficiency and be exempt from the rest of the law. So it, that's why I was wanting to know if they knew what their test score was and say if, if proficiency yeah. is, is 50 and they knew they were 49, yes, I would recommend, hey, it's worthwhile taking the sure. test. But if their score was 40 and they had to go up yeah. nine points where, again, statistically, you're not going to see a big shift between the two, then uh, why should I? Why, and the other thing is, is that by taking the retake and then going to summer school, if I didn't take the retake, I probably have a longer term to actually study and, and do better uh, on the post-test or something like that. Because I could, you know, the retakes are like next week, they're already gonna have the scores right now. So whenever they're gonna get the retake scores back, they could be studying right now instead of doing the retakes. So I, I don't see the incentive for a person who is approaching to take the retake unless they knew that they were only one or two points because statistically it's not gonna help them and it may hurt them. So what I would like to see is in the language, maybe we talk about changing the language to say that we will only use that higher number, you know, for the uh, uh, for, uh, below to approaching and not be punitive. Not, we still encourage them to take the retake but not be punitive to the to the approaching student by taking the retake because it looks like it's very well could be punitive to them. Just a thought. Much appreciated. Tell me why I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chairman. Yes. Just a, a, Mr. a quick follow on to that. And you know, I, I have a second grader in Metro schools, so next year we will be going through this. I know that it may be a little different, but you know, thinking about it from the perspective that Mr. Eby just provided, I do think there'll be a lot of value. Um, in having that information provided about how close they are to being at the next level up, whether below or approaching. Um, and, and maybe there, there could be uh, reasons not to do this, but 
maybe even a recommendation in some plain language for families who might not be as sort of keen to statistics um, about whether a retake would be likely or unlikely to result in a change so that everyone would have the opportunity to know, you know, I, I'm, my child is, you know, statistically within the margin of error and therefore this could be a worthwhile use of their time and testing fatigue and those sorts of things versus you know, my child is at the very bottom of approaching and therefore, you know, realistically, absent kind of some statistical fluke, it's not gonna make a difference. So um, just a food for thought because that could be of some practical value for families. Yes, Mr. Pierce. Um, so I, I just wanna acknowledge it's a really good point to bring up and to delve into and want to offer a few additional points, both of information and ongoing food for thought. Um, the first is that um, in terms of knowing what the baseline score is, uh, that is something that we can do, and David, please correct me if I say anything inaccurately here, after we have those test results back that come back on May 26th. So even though we may have cut scores earlier to determine proficient versus not proficient and or below and approaching within that, we need item level data in order to do that baseline calculation. Um, post that moment in time, we can absolutely be providing that information back out to districts so they understand where a student may fall. But as you all noted on the timeline, that is after the retake window has begun. So I just wanna make sure that A, I'm addressing the fact that it is our intent to be able to share that information out, but being realistic about the timeline, when that would fall and why. Um, the, the second piece that I would reflect on here too is um, making sure, and, and the chairman has said this multiple times, so I wanna uh, commend him for that focus, um, is just being sure that we're also focused on ensuring the kids keep getting the supports they need to get, right? So whatever decision this lands on, being sure that we're not accidentally putting out a notion or incentivizing not participation in a support that is certainly worthwhile for a kid who is scoring approaching. I think there is, you know, this value estimate and being able to say here is another opportunity and pathway, but you do not want to accidentally undercut that in a, in a different way. Um, to Mr. Holt's question too about kind of the recommendations, I think one of the things we'll have to consider in that space is our, what level of information we actually know from a state level, right? If a student had a bad stomach ache during the test, that's not gonna show up as a testing irregularity for us. We wouldn't wanna misguide a parent on saying, well, based on the statistical analysis from your end, this is a good idea or not. Um, but, but try to find the right balance of that information sharing to su best support districts and, and being able to have that communication point. So I wanted to make sure that we're just kind of bubbling up all the ideas around that too. But I appreciate the conversation on it, truly. Mr. Morrow. Go ahead. No, oh, good. Good. oh, just a very, very quick follow-up. So um, is it intrinsic to the timeline that you all will not have that information even in future years until after the retake? Because if that's the case, then I, it sort of, it may, may be a good idea, maybe not, but it doesn't really matter because the timeline prevents it. Or, or is it something where the timeline could be tweaked such that families could have that information about how close the child falls before the retake opportunities? One of the challenges that we have here, and it's just hard not to get a little bit weedy in all of this, but so bear with me, I'm happy to, to clarify as needed. Um, there's a really fundamental difference in all of this between raw score TCAP results and scale score TCAP results. Um, we this Friday are providing essentially raw scores, which is the number of points that you've earned on the assessment. Those are not actually the scores that we use to score the TCAP test. Those raw scores are converted into scale scores through an equating process, and that is done to ensure that statistically from one year to the next, the scoring of the TCAP test remains consistent. It, it's not possible for any standardized test that newly creates the form every year to ensure that the form we created this year is just as difficult, is exactly as difficult as the form that we produced last year. So that's where the equating process comes in, where we pick up those test results, we then look at our anchor set of items. There's a common set of items that we administer from year to year. There's a statistical process where we convert those raw scores into scale scores. And only once we produce those scale scores do we put kids into performance levels. I would much prefer 
just from a pure messaging standpoint, to have returned the scale score information at this time, along with this information about how children scored, but that honestly just takes us another week to produce the final scale score files and put performance levels on there. So we are returning raw score results this Friday because it literally saves us a week, and that week is incredibly consequential for the timeline that we've discussed. So uh, we're talking a lot about raw scores, and in fact, they do play a, a role in the baseline calculation, but they do not play a role in the actual assignment of scale scores, or rather, I should say, performance levels. So you're, you're absolutely right. Um, in thinking about it this way from a timing perspective, I would be very nervous about communicating about people's, how close you were to performance levels if we are still stuck using raw score results. Mm -hmm. Frankly, I, I'm uncomfortable pointing people towards raw score results as far as high stakes interpretations because it's truly just not how we score the test. It, it, it seems to me that the right way to do this is in determining adequate growth, okay? is if you use uh, the baseline score, uh, the, that the baseline is their TCAP score and not the retake, because then they won't be uh, penalized if they take the retake and score higher. Now, going back to Mr. Pierce's comment, I told you, we've talked about it before, is I encourage the districts, anybody who scores below uh, proficient to have the TISA provides to, uh, to tutoring dollars in there to have them all in tutoring because that's what we want is we want the students to learn but don't penalize a person by putting them by raising their baseline because they decide well I think I'll take the re retake maybe I can get efficient and I score three or more three or four more points higher and then now I've got a bigger jump right. to get through adequate growth and particularly since they're not going to know where their score is and what they need so that's a, something that we might look at tomorrow for a potential change. Just in the fall, I mean, it was part, that was half of the question. I was to say, so theoretically, 5% is your adequate growth, right? So if a student scores, you know, say 4% better on the retake, uh, now they have to get 5% better than that new score, correct? To get adequate yearly growth? Yep. So from the time of their original test, potentially they would have to have a 9% growth to be able to move ahead. Which that's that's a doozy. <laughs> uh, I'm just saying, like I would rather just stick, keep me with the five percent. I'm good. Yeah, that's why I say it's well. Great. And then the other question I had is so since it's all on adequate adequate growth per that student, correct? So if a student at performing or at approaching had a four percent adequate yearly growth, then he doesn't move along, or he would have to go to an another pathway of tutoring or another thing. Whereas if a student who was below had 5% increase, they would not have to do that, correct? A child who scores below on the spring TCAP will not be checked for adequate growth. Okay, the well, no. the only The only yeah. way they can is they do the retake and they score five or whatever it takes so, to get them into approaching. Well, yes, so if a child who scores below in the spring they sit for the retake, and if on the retake they score approaching, we will now use the retake score as their baseline, and gotcha. we will check them for adequate growth at the end of the summer. What is the range of approaching, or approaching? Like, what is the, the, the full range of that? The, this is where raw scores, the way we're reporting it, is not the appropriate way to look at it. When we, and we'll do this tomorrow, when we provide cut scores for raw scores, that's not how we scored the test. We actually assigned scale scores. We use the scale scores to determine performance levels. And then we reverse engineered a set of cut scores to apply to the raw score file. So saying it's, you know, zero to 15 points is really not the right way to think about. Even if that is technically accurate this year, it may not apply next year. But isn't that what you're doing to determine adequate growth? You're going back to look at the number of questions they scored correctly? which gave them a percent and you're going to look for five percent which points above that so that's the number so there, there because it's a, baseline to post test we're not we're not comparing essentially performance level determinations upon which the tcap i mean that's what it's designed to do um so we're just looking at improvement on a metric as opposed to making this interpretation that we expect to be perfectly consistent across years um so 
I'm just very adamant about drawing more and more attention to that raw score file and saying if you were 14 this year and you get to 15 next year, you're going to be approaching. And there's no guarantee that it will work that way in future years. No, oh, but if you're 14 this year and say approaching is 15 and you retake the test and you get 18, then you're now approaching. And that will be true this year, but there's no guarantee that that would be true the same next year. Yeah, I don't think we're looking at that. Okay. Uh, yeah, if I'm a family, I'm not worried about next year. I'm worried about right now and the decision okay. I have to make in a very short amount of time. And so I was just trying to see if, if, if since it's each individual's 5% growth, yep. theoretically kids who actually performed worse but hit their 5%, would move ahead where students who perform better but didn't hit their five percent would not. No. If a child is below and they don't reach approaching, now, if they're at approaching and they stay at approaching but they don't over the summer hit their five percent, and since there's a range, approaching is a range of scores, right? So if I'm on the low end of approaching and I get my five percent, I'm good. If I was at the high end of approaching but still in approaching and I got three percent, I'm not good even though my end score is higher than the guy going ahead. Right. But, but not good means you're going to you tutoring in fourth grade. Right. Right. That's I mean, one thing in all that will be so interesting like to see is. lower performers not getting the tutoring. As in a doesn't sense, have to do tutoring have to do in order tutoring. to advance. To, I mean, right. it'll be interesting to see how many, like, I, for, for me personally, if it were my child, I would have them do tutoring in fourth grade during the regular school day, right. then have them be in summer camp. I would imagine that would be true for many families. So it'll be interesting to see what ends up happening with that, but just something to, I'm personally concerned about how, how many families are aware of that and when they get the information tomorrow and over the next week, realize what their choices are. And it's, and the retention is this sort of plan, you know, X of like A, B, C, D, E. And, and that if you're in the approaching category, which I think is the plurality of students in the state of Tennessee, I mean, is it the largest category? close, I mean, it has been, that for all of them, they can, without doing summer camp, without having to worry about adequate growth in the 5%, go to fourth grade and have tutoring provided. That's, that is a pathway. Just Dr. Morrison. Thank you, uh, Chairman. Eby. I, some of the points I was going to make have already been made, and that was one of them, uh, Mr. Holt, is that I think, again, just stepping back, you know, obviously anxiety is at an all-time high right now. We heard from educators this morning, parents, you know, I mean, and part of it is that people don't know their options and it has been sort of a ever evolving kind of situation over the last year, communication is coming now. And quite frankly, it's why making policy at the last minute, not last minute, but final hour is problematic. It's hard to communicate this in a timely way when you're staring down a matter of days before a retake option is even available. But I do think, again, if you're in the approaching category, tutoring is really going to be the best bet for those students. I just, to your point, I'm not sure how many parents know that we need to, and uh, Mr. Percy was talking about the communication efforts, and maybe you wanted to speak to that a little bit too in terms of how you're trying to communicate through districts and to parents directly. Um, the other two things I just wanted to mention, I, I mean, I think continuing to explore innovative assessment models and looking to see how we can adjust our assessment so that we're not testing in spring and having this one dipstick that determines all of these high stakes decisions for students, I think is something we just have to keep our eye on as a state. And then interventions, we heard this this morning as well, earlier than third grade. I mean, it's really, this is just too late to be retaining kids and, and having a chance to help them with their, you know, phonemic awareness, their, you know, all the skills that we know lead to good reading need to happen in kindergarten, uh, first grade, second grade. So just figuring out how we can as a state continue to look at the law, the policy, the rule, and incentivize districts to take this on much earlier than third grade, I think is just the biggest question we have to wrestle with. Yes, one of the comments actually, you know, we did hear that this morning about st starting at kindergarten, first and second grade, but a comment that I've heard from some superintendents is that with the emphasis, with the number of people that are gonna be in third grade uh, summer school, uh, taking basically all the teaching capability and as you said, they're going to determine which grades are going to have summer school and which aren't. The K-1 and 2 won't have the teachers, so those students can go to summer school, and those are the ones that we need to, you know, catch now when we can. So, you know, to the legislature, anything you can do to give more money to, to the teachers to uh, funds for summer school so that we can get teachers, and then can we get the teachers 
uh, I think it's important to do. But that's one of the things I hear is going to be a real problem is there won't be teachers for K-1 and 2 well, this year because they'll all be at third grade and we really need them in K-1 and 2. Um, I got a couple other questions. Uh, the, the only, Mr. Sure. Chairman, the only clarification that I'd like to have from the department is so just listening to this, the discussion we're having here this afternoon and the lack of understanding on our own part and meet and really uh, teasing it out through this discussion this afternoon, we're uncovering more things that we needed to, to understand better ourselves. So imagine as we have been uh, parents understanding this, but even districts trying to, in short order, after we vote tomorrow and depending on the outcome, have to be able to ensure that parents understand these things and they can be guided and directed appropriately. Um, and, and so I think understanding what kind of guidance will be given to districts so that they can do their part, <laughs> like tomorrow, uh, already actually more than weeks ago. So can you share with us what the game plan is there to help them best understand this, in, in particular because of the things that were brought out this afternoon that maybe they've not even thought about, in all honesty. So could you help us with that? Happy to. Um, <clears throat> let, me, let me just, and, and forgive me if I sum up anything inaccurately, but what I do want to be sure that we call out is the primary question that is being raised here is about a kid who goes from approaching on the TCAP to approaching higher on the retake, right? And I just kind of want to make sure that we call out that's the bucket of kids we're talking about. So any language considerations tomorrow, making sure that that, that is what is addressed because that seems to be the, the question being posed. And um, I think in terms of the district communication, uh, we have had a third grade toolkit out this year that was released back in September. A number of supports have been released over the course of the year, but there are a lot of things that are all bucketed in this small time frame. Um, so we sent out our update to directors this morning that included a batch of new resources to specifically recap, these are the three areas that the state has responsibilities in as it pertains to helping you make these retention or promotion decisions. Those three pathways include the retake opportunity, the appeals process, and this adequate growth determination. So we wanted to be sure that there are documentation out there. Let me pause. The adequate growth one will come after you all have your vote tomorrow in, in terms of formalized uh, out there. But making sure that those are summarized very cleanly and very succinctly because people are working on a short turnaround time. And we recognize that and understand the pressure points that puts everyone under. The broader set of decisions, I think it is important to recognize this. We have had kind of a graphic out there for the better part of a year now that outlines the pathways for students who score approaching or scoring below. And that has been there and very consistent in districts. Uh, you know, I, I was on the phone with the district on my drive in uh, over here today who is planning a mass communications campaign on Monday with their results. I, I want to commend the districts who are proactively thinking about those determinations. And note that some of the other pathways that are not so state driven, some of the exemption considerations that have been touched on, um, largely come back to local decisions, right? And, and just to be able to note that when you're talking about a student with a disability or a suspected disability, that's going to have to be decided by people who are interacting with that student on a daily basis, right? Um, and that, that becomes an important piece of the communications that we're trying to support districts on doing, but knowing at the end of the day, districts are owning that communication path with their, their stakeholder groups as well. Um, Thank you for that. One question. Will, the data that's going to go out tomorrow, will we get a summary of the overall state so we know what percent of all the students are proficient and not proficient? probably defer to my colleagues on that one we've always announced spring test results and we usually do that once we've completed a little bit more of all of our psychometric quality control work we have really just prioritized third grade ela to get that information out um, technically we are not releasing all raw score and scale score information with performance levels to districts until next friday so at what, present so what there are you is giving, not what are you giving the districts tomorrow they're getting the raw score results mm -hmm. for all like a district will get a file with the raw score results organized by their students in all each of their schools and it will just say here's the number of points that your child earned on the assessment 
they'll also have access to a table that gives them cut scores for students that were below or approaching meta or and approaching and met expectations. So they can then take that table and apply it to the raw score results that they have and determine which of their students are in which performance category. So, so why can't you do that statewide and say 65% of our students are going to be down at this level and 35% are going to be, if you've got that, it sounds like you have that data, uh, why, can't, why can't that data be provided? I'd have to, de to defer to my colleagues on what the plan is for our, we typically, again, we announce spring TCAP scores at the same time every year. We do that for all subject areas and all grades, uh, and we will do that again this year. Um, and I'll just, I need to defer to other members of the department about when that's going to occur. Sure. My apologies. Request. Can I just, just well, I, mean, I mean, if it's possible, great. But I, I understand given the post equating and all, I mean, this is, it's complicated. May, we may need to go as a board back through kind of a, refresher for some 101 for others on how test results you know once a student takes a test what happens and when i mean because it is there's so many moving parts and i only know enough to be dangerous but it might be helpful at a later date we can think about when that would be appropriate so we can talk about things like post equating and how you take raw scores and convert them to you know thresholds for performance across tcap um, seems important for us to understand that more deeply. And I would just reinforce, we engaged in a very different process this year just to get third grade ELA results back as fast as humanly possible. Um, so this is just a, it's a very non-typical space for the department to be to try to get people this information even just a week earlier than we would typically feel comfortable that we've completed all of our analyses and we've, we've dotted all of our I's and crossed all of our T's and scoring every TCAP test. So another question, <laughs> the engineer in me. Uh, you're only taking ELA TCAP versus ELA uh, for the post-test, retake, whatever. But the determine whether a person was proficient or not was an overall ELA score, which included the writing part of that, correct? But the writing is not gonna be used for the other. Have you looked or can you look separate you obviously can separate writing from reading and look to see how many of those writing scores influenced the reading scores to either drop a student down into below or a student who should have been below move them up to uh, uh, approaching because the writing score was heavily one direction or the other do you have that and can you address that sure happy to we've done a number of analyses in that space because um, that was obviously a major design element for us uh, and something that we wanted to look at very closely. Um, we've essentially done a number of correlation analyses where we've looked at how a child performs on just the reading only items and we compare that to how the child performed on the test overall. The correlation for that is incredibly strong. It's 0.93. It's significant at 0 0.0001%. Um, we've also looked at classification analyses as well. Um, our historical analyses suggest that the writing only portion of the test is classifying students to performance levels 95% or above in terms of its accuracy. Okay. Thank you. That's helpful. And then the last thing, uh, going back to the comment discussed a little bit here and I brought up last time. If, so if a student is 40 and they go to 45, you know, uh, versus one that's 45 that goes to 48, you know, the 48 has to do more. One thing that was suggested to me that I might want to look at in the future, not this year because it's not time to do that, is look at how, like on the ELL, on the WIDA, to exit out of that, it's, it's you know, a percent, it's, a, it's a, a number, you know, it's not an increase, but it's a number. And I think the AMOs are, for accountability, done something similar to that. So that may be something you look at for next year to get around some of these inconsistencies. And I'll just say in, in consultation with our technical advisory committee, we've laid out a number of additional studies that we want to conduct to continue to evaluate how the methodology is performing. So as soon as we have fall screening results this coming fall, we'll be able to say how did the performance of the students that made growth differ from those that hadn't. Do we continue to see that positive trajectory? Um, you know, we'll continue to look at that through all the screening assessments. 
And truly, we won't have a complete data model until we get next spring's TCAP results. And at that point in time, we can really compare just to what extent these predictions were proving to, to uh, do what we hope that they'll do. So we, we have that teed up to continue to evaluate. Thank you. Other questions? No other questions? Thank you, Mr. Piercy. Thanks, Dr. Laird. I think uh, it was a good discussion. Next item is the uh, Tennessee teacher vacancy data. Brooke Amos. Colleagues a little taller than I am. Um, <laughs> good afternoon, Chair Eby and members of the board. I'm Brooke Amos, and I am our Assistant Commissioner of Human Capital for the department. And I'm pleased here today to be here today presenting on our second, I believe this is our second presentation on our teacher vacancy data. Oh, this is, this is my first uh, workshop uh, presentation with you all. Um, we have a robust set of data. Uh, to discuss here today, um, but I would be remiss if I didn't start by thanking a few members of my team who have helped make this possible. So thank you to Martha Moore, Amy Floyd, and Jesse Gold for their work. And thank you also to the district personnel who shared and reported on their vacancies to make this analysis possible. My hope here today is that we can share the data and the trends of teacher vacancies across the state. Um, I've spent my entire career working in this area, uh, except for when I was a middle school math teacher, which may come into play uh, here in a little bit, hopefully accurately. Um, and this work is incredibly nuanced. Um, we'll talk about the high level national trends as well as what we see at the state and regional levels. But we also know that every teacher vacancy is felt very deeply in our individual classrooms and for our students and their families. And so while I'll be speaking a lot of the macro level, know that I've also been the individual at the end of the line hearing from districts and schools and families about teacher vacancies and take this work very personally. So I share this as my opening headline because sometimes when we're talking about data at this macro level, um, which is very important, <laughs> it can sometimes and be incredibly useful to us, we can sometimes get a little bit lost in the sauce. I want to make sure because I know we're all here because we care about the outcomes for our teachers and our students and their families. And that's a perfect segue, if you go back one, uh, to our pillars here where we're going to be focusing on educators, but we know that they have uh, such an effect on academics and student readiness as well. We're going to discuss some of the methodology, um, you can go to the next one, um, behind the data collection process that we're going to use throughout the conversation today. So next, to ensure that we're speaking a common language, I'm going to go over some of the terms on the slides with which individuals may have varying levels of familiarity. So a vacancy for term, for purposes of our conversation today is a teaching position that is not filled by a teacher of record or that's been empty for 20 or more days. A permit is an emergency credential given to an unlicensed teacher. For our purposes, we'll be talking about academic permits, um, which are available to an individual with a bachelor's <coughs> degree. Um, upcoming next year, we'll be actually implementing the occupational permit for the first time. Um, that is going to be a one-year permit for individuals in occupational areas, but this set of data is that academic permit, which is renewable three times. An endorsement exemption, sometimes colloquially called a waiver. Um, this is given to a licensed teacher, allowing them to teach in an area outside of their licensure area. As I said, I was a middle school math teacher. If I were teaching an English class, someone might apply for me to have an endorsement exemption, which would allow me then to teach outside of the area. Some fun facts for folks, uh, permits and endorsement exemptions have some call outs that are not allowable. So for permits, those are not allowable for special education 
elementary PE, and end of course exams. Endorsement exemptions are about the same except for it is allowable to teach an end of course exam while on an endorsement exemption. We do have a change coming up next year that is highlighted within our slide deck. This comes from um, the State Board Policy 5.6 embedded in our strategic compensation policy, which does have us um, able to seek out this data from our districts who have been, as I mentioned, phenomenal partners in this work. We'll go on to the next slide and discuss the collection process and what it's looked like year over year. Now, as mentioned, this is our third year, but this is really our first year where we're able to have some longitudinal data to discuss. Um, reason for that being that the collection process carved out a different definition for the vacancy between the first year of implementation in years two and three. And we think that's very important because in year one, um, a vacancy included those endorsement exemptions and permits. And we thought it was really important to be able to disentangle those classrooms that have a teacher versus those that may have a teacher on a permit or an endorsement exemption. So years two and three do have that similarity of population definition. And so that's why we feel pretty confident that we can make those longitudinal comparisons between just years two and three, excluding year one. So that's a note there. Um, there are some other differences in methodology. Um, one I'll point out, and this is a limitation, I'll be carving out a few of those throughout our conversation today, is that this is um, self-reported data from our districts when it comes to vacancies. And now I believe that everyone does their due diligence to give us the best data, but noting that it is self-reported data at a single slice in time. And we also know that the vacancy landscape can vary from October to after winter break to perhaps or the end of school year. So just, just some notes on that for folks. Um, considerations for future data collection. And I will be sharing um, a couple projects that we're also working on um, at the department and with various partners throughout the way. Um, but one of the things we're really excited about is we are working on a new tool within T Encompass that's going to give us access to more real-time, I won't say 100% real-time, but more real-time vacancy data that will be coming. We're not quite there yet, um, but that will be coming in the future. And hopefully next year, when we're talking about vacancy data, we will have that available um, for folks. All right. With all that rich background, we're going to jump into the data now. There are a good number of slides here. If anyone previewed the deck, you notice that. Um, so know that I will go more quickly through some slides than others to make sure that there is time for questions. Although if you have one that's just like burning, let me know and we can take it <laughs> during my presentation today. We are going to start with the national landscape, which folks have seen, I'm sure, varying headlines about national teacher shortage, um, information about the vacancy landscape. So what I'm gonna do is share the information about what we've seen from the National Center of Educational Statistics about vacancies, but I'm also gonna give you a teaser before we go on the next slide, that the national average of vacancies, these aren't those emergency credentials, is 4%, but Tennessee is less than that. We're at about a little under 2% vacancy statewide. We'll, we'll make some, yes. Uh, 1,009. Oh, yes. Yeah. So what we're seeing is that the national average, and again, there is going to be diversity in terms of school type, school locale, of what that's looking like, some districts with no vacancies, some with multiple, but just on average, we're at 1.5% positions vacant, but we are um, about half of the national average. That isn't those emergency credentials, although I do have some highlights about what some other states are seeing, which is much higher. Um, and we have some um, hypotheses as to what that is, but know that, spoiler alert, we are much lower than the national average well, there. Let me ask again. Yeah. So your vacancy is just missing teacher positions. Some, somebody's not sitting in that yes. position doesn't necessarily mean that they're a licensed teacher, correct? Correct. So that vacancy, it could be a sub that is recurring. So, you know, 
19 days on a sub, it goes to another sub. It could be that they've consolidated the class. It's that that position does not have a teacher of record, a permit, or an endorsement. See, I contend, I mean, I understand by your definition is correct, but I contend that misrepresents and misunderstates the teacher shortage that we have. Because if you, do you have the data for licensed teachers? How many licensed teacher vacancies there yes, are? For and we will get to that in the next slide. Sorry. You know, you, you are reading me right to my next slide here. So we're at about 94% of our teachers are licensed teachers in the state of Tennessee. So that includes both our teachers on permits, waivers, and vacant positions. That is also above what we are seeing as a national average. And I'll let that sink in for folks for a second. Now, again, this does not negate the fact that there are strategies to put in place and things to work on. But what it does show is that we have, so the national average is about 90% of licensed teachers. And there are some states that are seeing like 74, 76% licensed teachers, like Louisiana and Arkansas. So we are, seeing about 1.5% vacant, 3.5% permit, and the balance of that about 0.8% are on um, those endorsement exemptions. Now, I can say the permit and endorsement exemption data is from T and Compass. So that's our department data. That's exactly what has been credentialed. And then that vacancy data is self-reported, which does have those inherent limitations. We have 46 districts that reported zero vacancies, and 14 districts do have zero teachers on emergency credential. So again, we have sort of um, a landscape in which we have a sort of a regional, regional shortage, and also we'll talk about endorsement area shortages. So there's sort of that sort of like teacher shortages, and then sort of like that landscape, that next layer of the onion. <laughs> Uh, for visibility, these are the 46 districts that reported uh, zero vacancies. Some did use emergency credentials, but 21 um, reported zero vacancies uh, between last year and this year. All right, this is just a uh, different sort of slide snapshot of the districts reporting the vacancies and what that looks like by grade band. Okay, I kind of love this slide and it's particularly interesting because what it does is it looks at the percentage of vacancies in endorsement areas by their proportional effect. So this isn't necessarily the overall in size of vacancies because the elementary might kind of swamp it just because we have so many elementary teachers and positions in the state. So instead it looks at, you know, for a given number of world language vacancies, what is the proportional number of vacancies for a given area? And so we can see high numbers in areas like um, ESL, World Languages, Special Education. Special Education is one that also has the highest in size of, uh, I wanna say 281, yes, 281 vacancies in special education. Special education, though, as we remember, is the content area because of um, federal requirements. We cannot have endorsements or emergency credentials in that content area. Okay, and this is um, another sort of cut on the data, which lets us look at just the volume of permits and those folks who are on an emergency credential without vacancies. Okay, this is a very similar slide to the one we saw of vacancies, but this looks at the emergency credentials that we can see proportionally that are being used for um, the different endorsement areas. And again, we see some similar content areas rising to the top on this one as well. World language, early childhood, middle grade science. Um, but we are seeing like some of those areas like, you know, um, elementary, not necessarily being as high proportionally, although volume wise is, is somewhat higher. If there were 46 districts that had no 
Yeah. Vacancies. Uh, but then there's an average of 26 positions per district that are staffed by teacher or emergency credential. And that means there's some districts that got a whole lot of vacancies. Yes. And so what we didn't do is, you know, cut the tails or anything like that, take those out and kind of do any sort of more advanced statistical like reconciliation there. But yes, and when we see sort of the, the spread by core region, you will see that our um, our city and our rural areas do carry, um, which is aligned with what we see nationally for trend lines. Absolutely correct. This is a little bit of a make sense slide. Um, it shows the timing when emergency credentials are being applied for from our districts. And so those are surging at the beginning of the school year and then they taper off. Um, emergency credentials expire on June 30th every year. So our team does counsel districts because there are only so many that an individual educator can receive. So we do counsel them kind of at the end of the year to be like, you know, if it's coming in May, what school year are you really intending this to be for? Those sorts of things because we want to ensure that, you know, folks are using those appropriately. So we do sort of see the peak and then the diminishing effect um, there. Um, well, now look at the, um, to um, Chairman Eby, your point, uh, the differences that we see by core region. And again, this doesn't get to sort of that grain size of individual district, but we do see amongst core regions sort of that proportional effect. I will say sort of my, uh, my rightmost uh, column there, it says percent unfilled position. That might be better said is percent unfilled by a licensed teacher because it does include the vacancies and the emergency credentials. And, and we see a range. Um, we have sort of, uh, you know, our statewide average of about 5.8%. And then we see some regions that are, that are below that average and some that are, um, you know, much, much higher than that average. Again, um, this isn't giving us sort of that underlying piece of, of why. We know nationally some of the reasons, but you know, avoiding any sort of like causal correlative fallacy here, um, not necessarily getting into too much of that, although there are um, really four concurrent projects going on across the state with various partners that are getting into um, some of the like myriad pieces of licensure, recruitment, retention, because all, all of those nesting dolls do fit together and in partnership that lead into this work. And I can uh, speak to all of those in a little bit or in Q&A. Um, I can actually go past this slide and the next one. There are very similar cuts on the same information. And now we'll look at trends over time. So you'll remember, um, if you go to the next one, thank you. Um, we'll remember that I said that um, the national rate is 4% and we're around 1.5% on vacancies. And you'll also remember I said I was a middle school math teacher, but this slide took me a second. Um, so I will uh, go over this one just a little bit um, for folks in case anyone else is taking a double look on this. So the overall percent increase year over year is 16%. If you're just looking at that total in size at the top. It is in that use of emergency credentials, um, the permits and um, endorsement exemptions, where we see that 23% increase. Um, and that is because of the very clear stability we see in vacancies. The end size is actually pretty uncanny. It's within 15 um, from last year, this year, in terms of reported vacancies. And so the hypothesis, and probably a pretty solid one, would be is that districts are utilizing those emergency credentials to offset increase in vacancies um, uh, here in the state. And so this one, again, is just looking year over year. Um, and, and the change we see here is that it does go down slightly for the middle grades, that six to eight ban, um, but stays pretty, it diffuses amongst the other ones. What question, comment? Yep. So looking at this chart on the uh, emergency credential, up, up a couple of charts, 
one that shows the number of vacancies staying constant yes. yet the uh, emergency credentials and the um, uh, increasing by 16 percent total vacancies yeah, increasing by 16 that must say that the number of teachers licensed teachers we're having is going down yes so it would go down so we're at 94 percent I, I don't again don't want to be called on the spot too much but it would have been higher if someone else is doing the math back there they can but yes so we're at 94 percent currently one can imagine it would have been closer to say 96 percent last year maybe even a little higher than that so my point is is that we you know we may not have quote a teacher vacancy issue but we've got a, a pretty measurable drop in the number of licensed teachers that are teaching our students. Yes, we are absolutely seeing an increase um, of, you know, at least several hundred, um, 500, I want to say exactly, almost 530 um, in using the permit and um, emergency credential of about a workforce of about 70,000. We are seeing that shift, okay. certainly. Great. Um, and this looks at, again, by some of those, uh, this is back to overall count versus sort of like percentage wise of some of the areas in which we have higher number of vacancies by endorsement types. Again, special education, uh, do they are not utilizing um, any sort of emergency credential. So you do see uh, high numbers of vacancies in that area. Um, and one of the things that we are interested in looking at for our endorsement areas, especially the ones that we've been utilizing the free endorsement pathways, is sort of what are the effects over time of that? I think we can all say that having an educator who is receiving that endorsement pathway is making that person a stronger educator, better for working with our diverse learners, no matter what their position is. But sometimes it does take a little while for that person to if they're moving into another role. So that's one of the things we're looking at capturing over time is what is the content area that an individual is staffed in who has participated in one of our um, endorsement, our free endorsement programs from the department. And this one is pretty similar to what we've looked at before. We'll probably go on to the next one. Yes, and this is that cut you were also um, addressing uh, Chair Eby, is that this shows us that not all areas and locales have the same um, vacancy or use of emergency credentials. And um, I think, again, that is a trend that we see um, nationwide and certainly is one that we see here. And also we hear from our directors of schools um, as well that, you know, folks in different areas um, have, uh, you know, just some different, different challenges and different needs and also sometimes different volumes of positions to fill. Um, again, this is very similar. Just really wanted to give you all a lot of ways to engage with these data. Okay, we'll talk a little bit about what is going on uh, with the department. Um, well, I got a little bit ahead of myself. Uh, we were gonna talk about a little bit of supply and demand. Uh, so one of the things that I think is very interesting is that the number of graduates from EBV programs has stayed relatively consistent across the state over the last several years. Now, this year is a little bit um, artificially suppressed right now because as we all know, it is graduation season. Um, can't go anywhere without seeing a graduation right now. And these data were pulled um, prior to having sort of like that full count. Um, and this is different from sort of what we've been seeing across the nation in terms terms of really precipitous drops in enrollment and graduation of EPPs. Um, again, I think a, a well-founded hypothesis is because of the just um, incredible investment the state has made into our EPPs, into programs like Grow Your Own, our Tennessee Teacher Apprenticeship. These are not always the fastest um, mechanisms to get an individual into the classroom. You know, it's not a tomorrow fix, but I think a long-term commitment to that work um, is is paying off here in the state um, and our retiree numbers. Um, what we don't have here, which I think folks would be well within their bounds to be curious about is how this matches up on endorsement areas. It is often the case that there is not a one to one match 
between the areas in which folks are leaving and where folks are getting prepared. I will say that there is work happening between our EPPs, eight of our EPPs, CEDAR and the department, to think through recruitment, especially of high need endorsement areas, especially special education, and also the retention of those teachers within those first five years that is so critical. So I think lots of folks are thinking about these things really in a really targeted way. And I'm very grateful to have all of these individuals as partners in this work. Another valuable piece of information, maybe you have it, is, uh, you know, you got 4,000 graduate completers and 1,500 retirements. So it's like plus 2,500. How many of those completers stay in the state of Tennessee immediately? And how many go out? Yes. Absolutely. What is that pipeline transition from enrollee to completer to hired to years one? Absolutely. Those are certainly the questions that we are very interested in answering. Okay, these are our 44 education preparation providers. Won't spend a ton of time here, but for um, folks' engagement and interest. And. These are some of the strategies. I've alluded to a few of them throughout our time today, but I do think that the state has had a multifaceted approach to a lot of the challenges that we've discussed. Um, and I'm, I'm certainly thankful for the work that the department has done and various partners have done um, in these work. Um, a couple things I'll highlight at the bottom here um, is that we are working on a, I think, a really dynamic tool that is going to be available for our EPPs and our districts and also candidates. It's help going to help show those vacancies in more real time. Again, it won't be exactly real time because of some system issues, um, but it will show like what are the vacancies, let districts know what candidates are graduating with which endorsement areas, and then let candidates show their interest. I'm liking it, likening it a little bit to online dating, but there will absolutely be no component of that. Please rest assured, <laughs> it will be completely above board in that regard. But as a way to say, like, if I'm graduating from an EVP with a mathematics endorsement, what does the landscape look like? If I'm a district looking for a math teacher, what does that landscape look like? And if a candidate agrees, what is their contact information to help make those matches fluid? And if I'm coming from out of state, I can share my information with the districts and create an exchange, um, which we think and hope will be a great value add to, to folks. Um, and then the department has conducted a retention listening tour and they've collected over 160 hours of interviews and feedback from our teachers, administrators, and industry experts on what their experience has been like, what is um, going to help them, what to continue to grow and stay as an educator in the state. And then the process is happening now to sort of coalesce that information and think about what the state can do, what work we can do with our local LEAs um, to help with that. I talked a little bit about the limitations already. Um, and I think I also hit most of the future considerations. Um, so I won't spend a ton of time on that, but you know, we have a lot of questions and I think you all have helped elucidate some of those as we've been talking today. Um, some of these data pieces do take a lot of work and a lot of like really robust like data chops uh, to be able to answer. And so some of them were, you know, trying to prioritize those pieces. And then also that ability to access real time vacancy data, just given what we have in our systems versus what our districts have in their systems, you know, that is we're, we're going to be better. Um, but getting that sort of like immediate like teacher resigns on Friday. When do we know it? That lag. I think it, we're going to get better on it, but it will always be um, a bit of a lag unless everyone was working from the same system across the state. So I think that is it. I'm gonna check my time here. I think I'm doing okay, um, but happy to take questions from you all. Thank you, Ms. Davis. Any questions? Mr. E.B., I do wanna ask one question. It goes back to the previous, <laughs> can you hear me? Chairman, I'm sorry. I got to get used to that still. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think it was the one before that slide. Sorry. Um, you talked about the additional strategies and these par EPP partnerships. Um, you talked about the vacancy sharing data. The listening tours, the listening tours are with 
the districts? They were with individual teachers um, across the state and administrators okay. as well. So with teachers across the, the state that are already in the pro already have graduated, they're already certified. Yes. Um, something surfaced recently in a director's study council session with one of the EPPs, and I, I do not know if this is unique to this one university uh, and if it's even the beginning of a trend that needs to be examined and it has to do with t individual candidates who have gone into the program to be an educator are switching midstream mm -hmm. out of um, anxiety. Yeah. And I had to ask the question. I, I know there's anxiety out there. There's anxiety about a, a lot of reasons, but can you put your fingers, your finger or point two um, specifically, is it one thing over the other? And I, I think it bears investigation because if it is a new trend that could be surfacing, I, I would say if there's a way to get at that type of information to the early possible predictors, and it just may be a fluke this one semester at this one university and may not be an issue, but it's just something I, I think we need to, to explore if you all have time yes, to I, talk to EPPs and just even if it's a survey of, of EPPs to see if there are any emerging trends in that regard. Because yes. you mentioned the partnerships because I don't really know exactly what that means or what that looks like and if you could expound on that. Mm -hmm. That would also help. Yes, Thank twofold. You. I really appreciate that feedback. Um, I, I think about two things that are happening concurrently. One is the partnership between EPPs and CEDAR that is looking at the very question of retention. I think retention is twofold. One is getting individuals to graduation, um, that um, not having individuals leaving the pipeline, and two is what that looks like their first five years. So I do think that's one topic that we can be really aware of now, especially hearing from you on that too is um, Tara is working on a an analysis and this is you know separate from the department although we certainly serve in an advisory capacity looking at persistence of undergrads in EPP programs and what that experience looks like and that will take you know a little bit of time but it is a question that's being explored. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Wells. Can, can we touch on just pay a little bit I, I don't think yes. you're, you're you're tracking it but you know what we're always hearing. Uh, so at the state level, you're always hearing other states pay more. Uh, I lived in Hamilton County for a while. We always heard people were driving from Chattanooga into Georgia. Um, and then, of course, in our districts, our superintendents are always talking about the county over that pays more. Um, but when, when I'm looking at the, the school, the, the, the vacancies, maybe it doesn't, it doesn't look like it is the schools that, that, that pay less um, compared to others. It's, it's kind of all over the board. And I wasn't sure... Have we ever thought about tracking that at all? Maybe how it compares from state to state, uh, but also how it compares within our, our districts. I think that is a really great question. I think one of the things that I know has been on folks' mind and that I've heard from people that they are really grateful for is the increase in pay that we are going to be seeing leading up to base salary pay of $50,000. I think that is certainly a threshold that educators are, are very grateful for and looking forward to. And I do think some of that um, disaggregation would be a very interesting um, piece to look at. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that helps us when we're comparing, you know, states or. Uh, but when when you raise the minimum, you know, if everybody if everybody goes up, are they still jumping from one district to the other? And and I just don't know if it's anecdotal or if it, if there's if something truly there. So just curious. Yeah. Good question, Mr. Jensen. Yes. Um, in looking at your information, you divide it up into the regions. Yes. Is it possible to get that by our districts? It certainly is. I think, again, this is that additional layer yeah. um, that, you know, we're, we're hoping to look at over the next year. Yeah, it, it would be helpful to see what your particular district looks like. And also, I think that would also not so much with the EPPs, knowing where they are in the districts and the regions. But the to divide up in northwest, southeast is, I mean, it's understand it, but it's it, it's hard to know how that impacts the folks that we're each representing. Yes, and we do have the, the data is reported to us at the individual district level. We reported at the aggregate for, you know, a few purposes other than the ones we've seen. Um, another project I 
didn't mention this, that we are, have partnered with the Department of Education's R5CC, their research branch, and they're going to be doing both some uh, really a qualitative analysis to look at districts, um, both districts that have high vacancies and districts that have low vacancies, but not just in size low, um, in low in the sense of um, particular um, outperforming what one might think and helping pull together some information for us that we'll be working in partnership with them on and also pulling together some white papers on strategies that are working across the state. Uh, I, I, what I'm thinking about is if, if, if I'm going to speak with one of the EPP leaders to have specific information about my region is, yes. and I appreciate the general, you know, the, the mm -hmm. high level, but it seems like more specific information might be helpful in talking to them and challenging them about addressing for example, the, the where you've got the big gaps. So sure. That's what I'm thinking. And that's the triangulation we're looking to achieve with the clearer vacancy dashboard. Uh, teacher transparency portal is, is what we have in a sort of a loose name for it right now that will have that sort of exchange between vacancies and um, the supply from, from our EPP partners. Absolutely. It's great. Great thoughts. Other questions? I've got a couple of questions. Um, so how many districts truly use differential pay, differentiated pay to hire these tough positions versus taking their differentiated pay and just spreading it out among the teachers? So I will have to get back to you on that one. Martha Moore and my team owns that work. I will say that we do get differentiated pay plans and, and there is variance in terms of what we see for that. But I can yeah, get back I mean, to you on that. I mean, I think all districts have a different plan. Yes. The question is how they're using The reason I asked the question is uh, we were at uh, Cheatham County this morning, and, uh, and you didn't address CTE positions in your, uh, in your talk today, but, you know, welding is always brought up. But that, that's an area that they really struggle with mm -hmm. filling these CTE. Now, I know we're changing the licensure, and Angie talked talk today about at the at the meeting about how we're changing that to make it easier for them to be licensed but still they can't go out and they can't they can't hire a teacher they cannot get a teacher and it wasn't just that one district there were several districts that, that were mentioned so uh you know the the differentiated pay was there for hard to get positions yes. but but i also know that you know districts spread that out because the teachers all deserve more more so i don't, I don't yes. know i'm just curious to know how, how many we're doing that. it's a great question and i we can pull that for you i think two things related to that one is that we are looking forward to enacting the occupational permit for the first time coming up in july where individuals can utilize that for folks who either have the industry certification or years of experience um so hopefully that will be able to be utilized for our districts and then we're also looking forward to working with the board and NASB and thinking through our licensure um, pipelines and pathways, but we will look into that and get back to you. I do think um, my point from earlier is, is probably accurate that it's used with um, a bit of variance in terms of how uh, much that's being used for those high need content areas. And, and I really appreciate the chart here that compares the suburban, the urban, the towns and, and the rural. And, you know, thank, thank you, TISA, for providing extra funding for the for those rural and city areas. They they still, and, and I was looking at the ones that have vacancies and don't have vacancies. I mean, the rural areas, and, and I guess the urban areas too, they really struggle with filling those positions. And uh, I would encourage anything else we can do to continue to uh, uh, support those. Because what happens is, is what we heard today, the rural areas, they go out and they finally find people you know some of them come up come in from walmart or something like that they train them up and then they get stolen away by the districts beside them because they can pay them more than that so that's something that we need to continue to work on and because we want to educate all the students and provide them all the opportunities this time. absolutely other comments or questions well thank you for this very important day to appreciate it and we look forward to continuing to to get more data on it. So. Yes, thank you. Appreciate all the thoughts and feedback. Truly. It's uh, three o'clock and uh, we're a little bit ahead of schedule. So why don't we take a 15 minute break? We'll start back at 3.15. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> <laughs>
Let's reconvene. Uh, the next topic is Tennessee Early Literacy Assessment. Dr. Christy Wall, Ms. Brooke Amos. Chairman Eby, State Board of Education, good afternoon. Thank you for having us today. Uh, Chrissy Wall, Assistant Commissioner of Instructional Strategy for the Department of Education, here to uh, workshop the item listed above on the agenda, Tennessee Early Literacy Assessment. Before we dive into the content of the workshop and presentation, I just want to note um, this is an artifact, a working project that has been um, ongoing and under development over the last year and a half since uh, the literacy assessment was adopted and put into motion um, and annotated in code. Please know that um, you know we've put forth uh, a considerable amount of research um, both internally, externally, trying to um, ensure that when we operationalize and propose this assessment that it is of the best quality that can be put forth and um, under the stipulations that are provided in the Act. So just wanted to note that. I've been with the department um, for the last less than a year, so this has been a project that's been ongoing. Not that I don't take personal responsibility for the development, but please know that it's changed hands a couple of times in terms of leadership um, changes, but this project also covers the Office of Human Capital, the Office of Academics, and, um, and many others in, in our department. So just wanna let you know that this has been an all hands on deck type project, um, especially over the course of the last eight months to finish the development and um, ready the proposal for the first reading and for your review. Thank you. So again, this initiative um, and project hits on all three of our strategic areas, academics, educators, and student readiness. As we look at the overview of this content um, in terms of the assessment design, we're gonna spend a little bit of time in these three categories, Literacy Success Act and the requirements um, that have been set forth for this assessment, the actual assessment development and design where I would anticipate there will probably be quite a bit of questions um, and so we can, we can open the floor at, at that point or perhaps at the end. We'll also walk through um, some communication and implementation recommendations. Obviously, we've thought through kind of what the plan should and could perhaps look like, obviously pending state board approval of this item. So we're gonna jump right in with um, the TLSA requirements as uh, noted in Tennessee Code Annotated 49-1903. Um, there is an element, subsection A, references specifically that there is a, to be a Tennessee reading instruction test developed um, and ident or identified by the department and approved by the state board that tests the candidate's knowledge of foundational literacy instruction. And then part B articulates that there um, should be providing evidence of documentation for a candidate's successful completion of a foundational literacy skills instruction course or professional development um, as we commonly refer to it. And that's um, annotated um, as 49.1906. So please know that as we talk about this assessment, there are two pathways to meeting, um, to meeting this need for assessment. There's the professional development and the training path, which is articulated in subsection B, which is our Reading 360 initiative. There is also the literacy assessment, which is part A, of which we'll spend the majority of our time talking about and working through to meet both of those uh, required elements. In terms of the Department of Education's responsibilities, um, we were tasked with developing a foundational literacy skills assessment, which is known and referred to as the Tennessee Early Literacy Assessment, that tests uh, the candidate's knowledge of foundational literacy instruction as identified and defined as evidence-based methods of teaching students to read that includes phonemic awareness, phonics, fluency, vocabulary, and comprehension that enable students to develop the reading skills required to meet Tennessee academic standards. As we'll note, the EPP standards were revised and approved um, by you all. We'll, we'll reference a policy in which those correlate, but that was done about a year ago. So ensuring that this assessment alignment um, to those standards that have been revised was the utmost of importance and significance in the development of the assessment. 
We are also tasked as a department to um, determine a score or present a recommendation for a score that constitutes a passing rate and then have you all vote uh, to approve that score and then offer a test at no cost to the candidate who is accessing the assessment as well as the educator prep providers. So no cost at anyone outside of our agency that's um, engaging and interacting with the assessment. Um, a couple other things to note before we jump right into the actual development and design of the assessment. Um, we have had, like I mentioned, a collective collaborative team um, working on the development and design of this assessment. Um, I've got a team member here, several team members here that have helped and been very instrumental in the delivery um, of putting this together, putting this item together and making it operational and functioning. Um, the assessment is aligned to the blueprint that's mapped out and matches the EPP um, literacy standards that were recently revised. It will be made available to all teacher candidates through a platform called Teach All that is a statewide learning management system hosted on the department's Best for All Central website. The assessment supports other professional development to teach literacy, including training gained in educator prep uh, programs, the praxis exam, teacher licensure endorsements, and classroom experience. So it really is a culmination of all of these things. In developing the assessment, the department expanded the Reading 360 Foundational Literacy Skills Assessment that current practitioners have access to uh, to ensure strong alignment to the state's expectation for early literacy instruction and student outcomes. The assessment in and of itself is designed with 25 items and there are four versions of each question which we're about to get into. Each learner that takes the assessment will be presented with a randomized combination of questions 1 through 25 in order and the results um, of the variations of this test come in a combination of manners and we'll talk through that here briefly. So in terms of the assessment considerations, we've, we've touched on the Tennessee Literacy Success Act and the requirement of this assessments, uh, assessment for educator prep uh, programs to offer to their student teacher candidates. This standalone assessment is predominantly designed to provide a pathway of um, completion and compliance uh, to the alignment of the foundational literacy standards and demonstrate a level of mastery from the instruction they've received from their programs. Okay. Again, the other pathway is engaging in the, the course one early reading training, which is the professional development opportunity that also um, addresses the same skills in a similar manner, but it extends a training opportunity where, where teachers, current teachers, can access um, that information. So we can have alignment between both subsets of teacher, teacher and potential teacher candidates. Um, specific to the assessment, the assessment uh, simply assesses um, evidence-based literacy instruction that is grounded in the science of reading and emphasizes a sounds first approach to foundational literacy and also includes a high quality instructional materials component which is also represented in the foundational literacy standards. The purpose of this test is to ensure that all Tennessee educators have a shared body of knowledge uh, about the research of science, uh, the science of reading and teaching students how to read. The development pathways uh, that we'll briefly talk through, I know um, I referenced earlier that this has been a project that's been ongoing over the last year and a half. The development pathway for this particular assessment went through three different kind of categorical phases. There was a landscape analysis that was uh, conducted and carried out by the department, um, a thorough review of existing assessments, so off the shelf, um, you know, big company produced um, assessments, um, some of which had been operationalized in other states, were, um, were heavily researched. Uh, we were looking for anything that might be equivalent in matching the layout of our standards. The department explored, um, again, existing assessments um, that could serve as a standalone assessment to address the foundational literacy standards, but there were some nuances to our Tennessee standards for foundational literacy that were not appropriately captured in existing on the shelf 
assessments that were already produced. There was also a cost-benefit analysis. Uh, the department conducted a cost-benefit analysis of the assessment options, um, which really actually provided a significant barrier, not only in designing an assessment, uh, but also operationalizing it and maintaining that, that expenditure and that cost ongoingly. Um, the assessment must be fully aligned to the T Literacy Success Act standards, uh, which was of, of priority. Also, we looked into the options of modifying existing assessments to ensure full alignment to our standards, but that, in fact, um, posed to be a bit cost prohibitive. Also, looking at building an assessment um, that, that seemingly t was determined as the best and most viable pathway, which is what we're going to discuss today. The assessment creation in and of itself, so after this developmental pathway was exhausted, the department uh, landed on the idea of building our own assessment um, simply due to some of the constructs and, and confines both wanting true alignment to our standards and a unique approach in Tennessee. Um, the department partnered with ANET which is a vendor that, that is um, very well versed in this type of platform development. And with their assistance, they provided um, assessment assistance with the variation of the question and item types and sequencing the item types on the assessment within the design. To look at the layout, um, this graphic helps um, indicate the foundational literacy standards um, alignment that are represented um, in policy 5.505, the literacy and special area standard uh, for educators policy. Again, the layout of the assessment in and of itself is a 25 item assessment. It represents the categories and subcategory domains, all focusing on foundational literacy skills, such as sounds first, decoding and fluency, phonemic and phonological awareness, phonics and word recognition, morphology and vocabulary, and it also includes direct reference to the use of curricular materials or also known as high quality instructional materials that are currently in our classrooms across the state of Tennessee in the lower grades. Whoops, I'm sorry. All right, so to go a bit granular, uh, more granular, to review the item types. We did not necessarily provide exact examples of the item types that are on the assessment in the vein of security and keeping those items as a part of the assessment. However, I do want to go through the three different item type constructs that are on the assessment and explain to you kind of how those look and are represented in the assessment. So type number one um, of the item types is a multiple choice, very standard um, form of assessment. Essentially, um, each of the questions that are represented as a multiple choice item have four single select corresponding answer choices. Um, again, reflecting the alignment of those standard domains. Part of the reasoning and rationale behind selecting multiple choice, um, high validity, many many items to pick from that align to our standards as well as the item type provides automatic scoring for overall assessment performance which was um, a key and crucial element that we were looking for so the item type does not require human scoring and it does not provide delayed response and feedback to the teacher candidates that are accessing the test the second type of the item types represented on the assessment is a multiple select. The multiple select items on the assessments are constructed with a minimum of five answer choices and a maximum of up to eight answer choices. Again, representing the scope of the standards represented in our foundational literacy skills. Special note on this item type, no partial credit will be awarded for any multiple select items that are not fully and accurately answered. So there's no half credit if you get two out of the three selections needed, okay? This item type was selected because again, it provides automatic scoring on the overall assessment and quick feedback to the candidates looking to access the assessment. 
The third and final item type that is represented on this assessment is a drop down and matching type item. The simple description of this is uh, drop down and matching items include four components to answer each item type adequately. Within the components of the question, there are four constrained answer choices to select from. The types um, ultimately align to the standards as represented. Again, with this potential um, item type, no partial credit will be given for a partially correct response. So all answers must be accurate to get full credit or receive full credit um, in terms of answering the item or question on the assessment correctly. Again, this item type and the construct in this was selected because of the automaticity and scoring and the quick feedback that we could provide to candidates accessing this assessment. To kind of zoom out um, just a bit from the down from the individual item types, we're going to look at the assessment design and the form type. We talked about the variations and working with the vendor to ensure we had um, a lot of different types of questions represented on this assessment to provide unique opportunities for each test taker and it making it very difficult to replicate the assessment. So test takers will again be presented with the 25 questions through the online platform. Each question on the assessment has four possible, quest four, four possible questions, excuse me, resulting in a bit over a quadrillion permutations of the assessment. So just to delineate there, the questions have all of the variations. It's not four form types of the assessment. So a form type A, a form type B, a form type C, and a form type D, and then those being only the unique identifications. The, the uniqueness to this assessment drills down to the, to the individual assessment item to ensure that it's gonna be very difficult for folks that are accessing the assessment were to even see the same question represented. Um, across two different tests. You can see the visual that's provided, test taker one, two, three, and four across the top. The questions articulated in the left-hand column. Those letters representing um, different types of questions, but the question type representing the same type of content, okay? The item that the user sees is randomized when they start the test and the first time, the first time they take the test, and if a retake of the test is necessary. I wanna pause there and um, ensure that for our general understanding, if a teacher candidate accesses this assessment and is not successful, does not pass, the test in and of itself can be accessed and retaken time and time again. There are no limits or shelf life in terms of opportunities to take the standalone assessment and pass the assessment. They get multiple retake opportunities. Again, the table identified just shows the variation across the question types that are available to potential test takers. Some of the security features to mention, um, I had mentioned in the beginning that um, this test will be housed on our Best for All central uh, website through the learning management system called Teach All. Um, the test takers will use a single sign-on credential either through a department issued credential and unique identification or um, email address, or there's an opportunity um, for them to use a business to consumer credential, meaning that um, the business to user, I'm sorry, the business to credential user um, can flow through such accounts such as Google, Facebook, and Twitter to log in and access the assessment, ensuring unique identification for the individual. When the user, the, the test taker starts, um, retakes or leaves and returns the exam, they'll be presented with new questions. A security feature that, that has been um, discussed um, and it is open, open for comment uh, will be the idea of putting together some type of timeout feature and lo automatic logout. At the end of the assessment, uh, users are presented with the number of questions that they answer correctly and the percentage. That's the only feedback that they get. They do not see which questions they answered correctly and which answers, uh, each, each, each of the questions that they answered incorrectly, okay? Upon the passage, users are certified by our platform using a badging system. The badges are tied to the individual user and cannot be shared 
Those badges then correspond and communicate to our licensure department um, and, and we'll, we'll go into the licensure phase denoting that they've met this requirement um, and satisfied a passing score. Um, in terms of a passing score, a recommendation that we are asking you all to consider um, in establishing is an 80%. An 80% uh, passing rate or passing score would allow candidates to miss five or fewer questions on the assessment. Uh, this recommendation uh, comes with indication of a passing score aligning to a summative um, assessment that is held at the end of our early reading training. And so folks that are engaging in the professional development have a check for understanding and a moment of application for what they've learned in their training and they need to demonstrate an 80% to ensure that they've learned and mastered the content that has been um, used as a form of professional development. So again, with this 80% um, recommendation, it holds very parallel to what folks are experiencing in the training element of the Tennessee Literacy Su Success Act and the programmatical things that we're offering uh, to support teacher learning, as well as the assessment, the standalone assessment. So in terms of the communication and implementation, uh, we've had some, some cross-functional teaming opportunities to think through um, what this looks like and how to best operationalize it as, as an agency. And so the licensure processing, you can see the overview um, that's been provided um, in terms of how the assessment communicates with initiating licensure with our human capital team. Um, effective August 1 of this year, candidates seeking to obtain, renew, or advance a teaching license um, with at least one qualifying endorsement should provide evidence and documentation um, of an approved foundational literacy skills course or passage of this assessment. So it's an either or that they can provide in the vein of licensure. Completing the free um, early reading training, secondary literacy training, or passing the early literacy assessment meets that requirement. Applications for initial licensure uh, or licensure renewal or advancement and additional endorsements received on or after August the 1st will be evaluated against those, requir those requirements. Um, the badging system, as indicated um, a, at the end of the assessment piece, signi signaling um, a passing score, the badging system will coordinate with the licensure department. As I indicated, they'll facilitate this process that the department has worked through multiple vendors to connect our new learning management system held in Best for All Central to TN Compass, where our educator licensure information is, is processed transactionally and held. Um, candidates who have the Tennessee Literacy Success Act badge on their TN Compass account will be eligible to go ahead and start their transaction for licensure such as obtaining, renewing, or advancing. We've put together a very brief communication outline. Again, I just wanna note and elevate that all timeline estimates are based upon formal approval um, by State Board of the assessment, but we've got um, the audiences outlined as the candidates themselves seeking to access the assessment, districts and teachers, as well as EPP providers, and some recommendations around timelines, but again, subject to board approval. So in summary, and then we can open up for questions and, and talk further um, in detail. In summary, um, a couple of key points to take away from this item. The assessment aligns fully to the EPP foundational literacy standards and the use of high quality instructional materials. It is uniquely designed for Tennessee. It does not remove or replace the need for the praxis assessment. The praxis assessment still, still remains and this will be done in addition to. This assessment is free to test takers and free to EPP providers as we're statutorily required to, to provide and produce. It does address the Tennessee Literacy Success Act requirements and um, the, the assessment in and of itself is prepared for launching pending approval. Again, um, the development of this item has been long in the making, and um, we wanted to make sure that as we discuss the specifics of this assessment, that it is realistic, it is in a living 
version and format not being talked about or referenced hypothetically, but it does in fact exist um, and is ready for um, full consideration and, and questions um, you know, from you all. So with that, I will um, open up. We also have lots of bodies of research and references on the science of reading um, for your reading pleasure at another time, but we can go ahead and open up for questions um, and further articulation about the assessment and the development of, of the item. Thank you, Dr. Wall. Questions for Dr. Wall? Yeah, go ahead. I've got some too. Go ahead. Okay. All right. Um, first, I mean, it looks like y'all have done a really solid job in addressing, uh, trying to align it with the, all the standards that have to be aligned with. Is the, how do you assure the security of the test? I mean, if it's online first, is it timed and what keeps, is it open book or, or uh, how, how do you assure the security of the test? Chairman Eby, that, that's a great question. We have struggled and kind of wrestled with that question. Um, with the platform and the design um, in which it exists currently, assuring security is difficult. Um, uh, Charles Nicholson, our Senior Director of Digital Content, has um, kind of quarterbacked the project in terms of the technical aspects um, and its embedding uh, within our Best for All Central website and learning management system. Um, you know, there, there are some thoughts around um, after this first kind of launch um, and, and preparing to get this to the field. Um, about encouraging educator prep providers to, to bring it into their coursework and allowing um, teacher candidates to perhaps take it in a, in a class or as part of a practicum. Um, you know, I outlined the security features that exist as a part of our platform in terms of forcing the unique identification associated with an email address um, and also discuss the potential for a timeout um, function and feature, we'd be happy um, to discuss further and open to recommendations around the timeout feature um, and perhaps any other questions that, that might help with the security features, but understanding that it's um, of no cost to the EPPs, of no cost to the, to, to the test takers. Um, you know, it's difficult to emulate um, a, a type of secure uh, test environment such as Praxis where there might be a lockdown browser or a proctor supervising or something of that nature, um, just given given the tools and the resources that we were working with to develop this. When they take the test, uh, is there like an online affidavit or signature that said that they received no help from anybody else? During, I mean, I can see, you know, uh, I mean, I trust the teachers, but, you know, having them sign something, you know, reminds them that this is their test or something is that, that absolutely yeah and, and that's a great recommendation that actually came up in conversation this morning amongst the programmatical team just asking like hey does this exist or is is this feature um, and function a possibility and so that is a recommendation that we're happy to take back to the development team um, to see but I can tell you that currently the assurance or sign off page to say like I took this on my own and you know test integrity and things like that do not exist currently, but not to say that it couldn't be added. So we can absolutely take that recommendation back to the team. Thank you. And, and then you said that you, um, I lost my train of thought here, you had done a thorough analysis of looking in-house versus out-house on how to develop it, and you made the decision, you did a cost-benefit analysis. Just curious how close or how far, you know, did it point you to doing it in-house because my experience is, is that more things you subcontract out, they can do it much more efficient. Now, I understand this has to meet Tennessee standards, but uh, how extensive was that evaluation and, and what was the cost of, to do it out-house versus in-house that you got? Sure, that's a great- To make a point of clarification, I don't think you went to the outhouse to find this. <laughs> I guarantee Thank you. you that when I was growing up, we had my neighbor across the street, my best friend had an outhouse. <laughs> I appreciate that point of clarification. Thank you for saving me from stepping into that one. 
Um, Chairman Eby, I'll be quite honest. Um, when that evaluation and the cost um, cost analysis and landscape analysis was conducted um, across uh, two or three different divisions within our agency, I was not a part of the team. However, I do have that information just simply not in front of me. I'd be happy to share that with you at another point, um, but, but it was relatively exhaustive in terms of looking at other states that already had off-the-shelf assessments that they were operationalizing or relying on their vendor to operationalize. And my counterpart, Brooke, is here to help. So she was a part of that work, so I will defer to Brooke. Thank you. Happy, happy to share with that. Um, wasn't um, originally part of that work, but can can share some of those details with you today. Um, for this assessment to be no cost to use an existing um, assessment or to even create one within the state, um, so using an, an existing assessment, um, we're, we're talking about a very large volume of educators in the state who would need to potentially take this assessment. Now, again, we know that some folks are taking the training, which would lower the number, but when we're thinking about max liability, um, number could exceed um, almost six and a half million dollars just because of the cost per assessment when using um, a vendor, which is about one up to 150 per assessment. And then there's an additional development fee if we were to use it in state, um, which would be about $250,000 and probably a two plus year process. So just to note on that, because of the free component of this assessment, it, it does hit a pretty high um, potential fiscal note. Thank you. And then when you do compare the uh, taking the training versus taking the exam, uh, <clears throat> when will the exam period open up and will it be done? And I know they get the results immediately and sit there and take, 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 take. But if there's quadrillion examples, then we take it quadrillion times and never pass it. Is there plenty of time from when they, uh, you know, they can take the written test versus get into the course and take the course exam? When, when are the courses offered? Yes, sir, that's a great question. So the early reading training course <clears throat> and the secondary literacy course that both meet the qualifications and criteria of the training pathway that we've set forth are actually live and asynchronous available through our website currently. So at any point, a, a teacher candidate who is attempting to take the assessment and perhaps is unsuccessful can go straight into the training at any time. And so it really becomes, um, you know, a communication piece on our side in terms of articulation. You can take the standalone assessment or engage in the training. It's a two path opportunity um, as soon as we can communicate about the assessment piece. So did you say on the, the training course, there is an assessment after that, uh, an exam after that? There is, I wouldn't necessarily call it an exam, but it is an opportunity for folks who are engaging in the professional learning to demonstrate what they're learning. Okay. Um, so in the training, when they do, I've, I've done virtual, I do virtual training quite a bit. Is there a process to assure that they have gone through every slide and spent time on, on the slides or something? Yes, okay. yes, there is. Right. Thank you. Yes, sir. Dr. Morrison. Thank you, Chairman Eby. Just a couple of questions that I'm looking at my notes. We'll see if they've been answered. But again, I appreciate the partnership on this. We've had extensive conversations with you, Dr. Wall, and your team, and really just appreciate the thoughtfulness that's gone into putting together this plan. And just want to underscore from my own perspective how important the Foundations of Reading is as an initiative for the state. We've got to get to a place where we've got all teachers who are sounds first, who are thinking about phonics. And so I think this test represents one of the ways that will ensure that that training is really happening at scale so that all of our early learners are um, engaged in that work. So I'm excited about what this represents. Um, are we, we going to be able to track, so if you have a test taker who's taking it multiple times and then they eventually pass, just for our own edification on the test and you know what that candidate might need in terms of support, if they have to take it 10 times to pass, are we going to be able to track some of that, do you know, through the platform I'm seeing some odds? Yes. That's great. Yes. Just, again, because I think the more data we can generate, knowing that this is a new type of assessment that we haven't used for licensure in the past, just the more we can um, track and report, I think will be great. In terms of communication, for out-of-state candidates, that seems like one of the hardest ones. Just I know I've had a few people reach out you know, asking for advice, and we're sending them over to you all. But the out-of-state folks coming in, hopefully we're just doing everything we can to communicate to them as soon as they make outreach about licensure, that this is something that they need to take, especially if they've got a job and are 
planning to teach later this year. Yes, and that's a great point. That is a, a group of educators that are typically hard to reach because essentially they reach out to us or the licensure team in terms of what does it take to get a Tennessee teaching license. And so um, Brooke and her team um, are very well situated in terms of the communication efforts um, to ensure that out-of-state candidates are aware of um, our emphasis and priority on really shifting the focus and, and the instructional practices. Also, the assessments required um, to be eligible for a Tennessee teaching license, particularly in the in the K-5 space. And so um, oftentimes we get all kinds of communication coming in from folks that are out of state. Oftentimes our communication um, on the human capital side and the licensure side lands on their website because most folks that are looking to come to Tennessee tend to go there first to get the instructions on how to start the process. And so as soon as we're able to articulate the literacy assessment, or the training, which the training opportunity is already there, but for out-of-state candidates, being able to articulate both pathways um, to meet the criteria will be will be significant and very helpful. Yeah, great. And then my last kind of charge is not just for you all at the department, but for the state board too. As we were talking in conversation leading up to this meeting, it made me think about the, again the praxis assessment, which, as you mentioned, will also be required, and just ensuring over time that we're taking a periodic look at what we're requiring on the praxis to ensure that it really is fully aligned with the foundations of reading so that we're not in any way sending a mixed message to our EPPs about how to train these teachers in the science of reading. And so I think that's just something maybe we can continue to look at together because I understand that there are other things in the praxis beyond foundations of reading that are going to be important for our early learner educators to master and show um, proficiency, proficiency in, but just ensuring that on the really important foundations of reading piece that, you know, both assessments are you know, equally picking up on the right things there. Yes, noted, and that's a wonderful recommendation. I know we've had a lot of internal conversations around ensuring that alignment is alignment is alignment, and there's equity across any assessments that validate our teaching licenses um, and ensure that all teachers are equipped with the knowledge and the skills and the capabilities to address our students' needs. So thank you for that special note. I know it's um, been on our minds as well. One other question. My understanding is this will be taken for any new teachers coming in, new licensures, and then the other teachers when their license comes up for renewal, correct? That's correct. So what percent of the existing teachers do you expect, like in the first year, uh, will be taking the exam? Is it 20 percent? Is the license, license your, how long is the license good for? Five years, 10 years? That is, a, that is an Office of Human Capital question. Can May I defer to my friend Brooke, who's right behind me, Absolutely. and I can hear she's rattling off the numbers, but she's got that information for you. That's a great question. Thank you, Brooke. Um, we anticipate the number around 20%. So about 20% of the teachers will be taking, taking the exam. Have we thought um, what happens if a large percentage, I mean, I, I'm not an educator, but I looked at, you know, <laughs> yes. I looked at the, some of the sample questions that y'all sent me. And they look tough. I mean, when, when you when you have to pick out, like, say, if you got five potential answers and you only pick out four of them, and you, the question's wrong, you know. Uh, so have you have you thought about what happens if a large percentage of your teachers don't pass? I, I know you got the the coursework you can take, and maybe that's easier to get through. But my goal is that whatever we do, we want to be sure that the teachers can effectively teach our students. Absolutely, and I do think that that is something that has been front of mind for us. I appreciated um, Dr. Morrison's question about communications, and so that's part of it, is ensuring that we are communicating early and often about the requirements so that individuals have time uh, to make an informed choice, whether that be the assessment or the PD. Or for some, I do think it will be both. I think some people are going to go to that assessment and are going to realize, like, hey, I, I really should learn some more about this. And that's really the hope, right, is that yeah. folks can take away that information and knowledge so that they can be as prepared as possible with students in the state of Tennessee on these standards. And so I do think we're going to have people diverting from the assessment to the PD and, and really that's functioning as intended at that point. Um, and so ensuring that folks know when the assessment is approved, whatever that assessment is, that folks know about that, that they know it is an either or, and that that's going to get them that badge um, to be able to then be credentialed for licensure. I do think we will have some folks still not hitting either of those criteria for those folks, as long as they're in a permittable subject area, we might see some folks 
being on a permanent pathway for them, that would be sort of the, not the ideal situation, but if we want to play out all of the potential outcomes, that could be an outcome as well. Oh, sweet. So they, they would operate on a permit instead of a license. That's interesting. Well, thank you. It's going to be interesting to see how the next few months go and how August starts out. Yes. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Thank you very much for your presentation. Very helpful. Thank you very much. All right. Next item. Next my agenda here. Pros licensure uh, items. Uh, Mr. Alex Anderson and Mr. Todd Madison. Pardon? Oh, yes. And welcome Ryan again. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, uh, board members, Todd Madison, associate counsel for the board, um, joined by associate counsel um, Alex Anderson and our newest staff member, associate counsel Ryan Shanahan. Uh, we will be presenting the license recommendations for licensure discipline at this time. We'll take any clarifying questions or note any items to pull for further discussion at tomorrow's meeting. Any questions? I would just like like to make one comment. I actually made it uh, at the Cheatham County Schools today. Is I read through these things every quarter, and I, it's just beyond me in some respects to see some of the things that you know that has occurred and results in a six month of suspension or even a termination. And I, I think a lot of it has to do too with training and the importance. And we talked about ethics, class of ethics, and being taught and assure that we get it taught well and continually. You know, in my business, in the nuclear business, I mean, we get training every three months or six months or something like that to remember what you're doing and why you're doing it. And I don't think there can be too little training when it comes to, uh, you know, actions by the teacher. So I would just encourage the districts to continue that training and the EPPs to, to continue training and what student teachers can do and what they can't do. because. You know, if we suspend a teacher for six months or a year or two years, that teacher is not valuable to us and is it teaching the students. So what can we do to minimize that? Just a comment. That's all. Anything else? Thank you. Well, just real quickly in response to your comment, um, I know that uh, we're going to, you know, start trying to work um, sort of hand in hand with these EPPs as far as training them up on uh, the teacher code of ethics and any sort of assistance we could provide to, to sort of head that off um, on the front end. So that would be excellent. That's Thank great. you. Thank you. All right. Uh, final discussion in German. Dr. Morrison. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, this has been very helpful. Again, I, I thank the, the department for being as uh, forthcoming and providing us the conversations and discussions. I think we all have things to think about tonight as we come back tomorrow to decide, uh, you know, how we're going to vote and, and uh, obviously not deliberate among ourselves, but uh, think about it ourselves and, and come back tomorrow for, for the formal meeting. Any final comments for me? Yes, Dr. Morrison. Just one reminder, we're going to start our morning with a little light reception for our Blue Ribbon School winners and Title I designated schools. So if you're able to come starting 8, 15, 8, 30 before the meeting, grab some coffee and a donut and congratulate these really excellent education leaders who are going to be coming together tomorrow. Outstanding. Final comments? No objection. Meeting is adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>